Jordan Chair. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Gwent Police and Crime Panel meeting in Tipinalta on Friday, the 31st of March 2023. I'd like to welcome everybody to the meeting. Thank you for coming along today. We'll start with some introductions. Uh, we'll move to my left. So I'm Jill Howard, Chair of the Panel, and I'm a member. Councillor Colin Mann, Capilli, everyone, the first chair. Councillor Gaz, David Splain, Gwent. Uh, we're in a check on Dawson. Well, David Jenkins, we've got City Council. Philip Fazina Hussain, you've got City Council. Councillor John Eason, Montreal Council, based in Calderon. Elder Gas, head of uh, communications and engagement at the PCC. We're on uh, Sam Slater, head of strategy uh, in the Commissioner's office. On it all, Darren Craig, the Commissioner's chief finance officer. And Sean Kennedy, chief executive for the business bank. Uh, Larry Thomas, Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner, can I firstly send sincere apologies from the Commissioner, who is unable to be here today. Unfortunately, he has COVID and is still testing positive. He's devastated that he isn't able to be in attendance, um, but he's, uh, you know, obviously um, I will be representing him. But it gives me also great pleasure to be able to um, pass on and introduce our new Deputy Chief Constable. <laughs> Rachel Williams, who has been with us uh, for four months. Um, I'm really pleased that this is her first opportunity to come and be introduced to yourself. Um, we also have apologies from the Chief Constable, Pam, who can't, Pam Kelly, who can't be here with us today, but absolutely wanted um, Rachel to be with us. Um, and, and, you know, over to you, Rachel, in terms of uh, Thanks, saying a few words, really. Thank you. Um, so, so I'm delighted to be here. I am, I'm Rachel Williams. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and uh, you know, apologies from from Pam Kelly. So, um, I've been with the force uh, since around November uh, last year, and then um, obviously uh, came in at, at a busy period of time for us. And uh, obviously, have been supported by a number of you since arriving. So, thank you very much for the support we've had so far. Uh, my role as deputy chief constable, of course, really is to manage the core business of Gwent Police to make sure that we manage everything from professional standards through to performance and culture, and a number of the different facets of the core parts of my role will today come forward for colleagues' presentations and, of course, uh, in a question uh, of us and ourselves as well. So, um, I formally, um, I have been from the Metropolitan Police Service for the last uh, three years up till now. Um, uh, when I joined Gwent, uh, in terms of uh, Welsh credentials, I actually grew up in West Wales, so I'm very proud, uh, so it's a, it's a return home for me uh, to Wales, as it were. So, absolutely delighted to be here. Um, and, of course, I'm delighted to be working with the PCC and, of course, all yourselves as well. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Holly Crawley, Professional Standards for Gwent Police. Yeah, good morning, all. Uh, I'm Sam Payne. I'm the Detective Superintendent. I'm the Head of Professional Standards within Gwent. Good morning. I'm Councillor Linda Clarkson from Torvine County Borough Council. <laughs> Morning, all. I'm uh, County Councillor Tony Keir for Monmouthshire, based in Usk. Morning, all. I'm Mark Jakes. I'm Scrutiny Officer with Caffili Council. Morning, I'm Kath Forbes Thompson. I'm the lead off. <laughs> Thank you all for these sections. Particularly warm welcome to Rachel. Thank you for joining us today. And to your colleagues, Holly, Holly and Sam, thank you for coming uh, along. We look forward to your presentation on the agenda. Um, please send our best wishes to Jeff and wish him a speedy recovery. I'm sure he'll be back to a bit uh, before long. So if you'll be watching online, Jeff. Good morning. Um, <laughs> okay, then. Gender right of one's declarations of interest. Do any of the members have any items to declare in terms of the agenda items? I always like to make out spatting feelings. Then, Dr. Black, please send the declarations of interest prepared. Then, do I some two apologies for absence? Clearly, we have um, commissioners' apologies this morning. Uh, any others? And, and Chief Principal Pam Kelly. Any other apologies? Thank you very much. Okay. Moving on then, agenda item three. The Grand Case and Crime Panel held on the 27th of March 2023. January. Sorry. I don't know. 27th January 2023. We'll take the minutes um, page by page. Any matters arising on page one, page two, three, four. 
It's been a very busy time for both the police and the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. So the, the, the report is tabled for your consideration, and I'm happy to take questions on your report. Thank you. Um, on page, should we take that page by page? It's probably easy to see now. Page five. One of the questions I had, Kate, was um, the diversion schemes that weren't driven by the service. There's lots of money invested from the commissioner's side into these schemes, 800,000 alone into um, the deaths. How do you um, review the effectiveness of that funding to ensure that it's providing value for money on the one hand, but also ensuring that the diversion these schemes are effective and they are diverted a few such years away from, from crime? Thank you, um, Jill, for the question. And I think um, it's important to reflect <coughs> on the purpose of the diversionary schemes. And, you know, we have a, a range of diversionary schemes, as you've already mentioned, from the White Drug and Alcohol Service that we, we fund with, <coughs> with our local authority partners and health partners, as well as our um, uh, diversionary schemes in relation to uh, women's justice, youth justice, and in particular, making sure that we um, support young people to keep out of uh, trouble from, from crime. Um, uh, the, the, the purpose of the diversion schemes is very much around trying to support people to um, have a holistic intervention that enables them to have their needs addressed and hopefully keep out of the criminal justice system and, and, and increase demand really for our for our policing colleagues. In terms of value for money and um, uh, making sure that we have the most appropriate uh, services, we have a robust um, commissioning um, process, robust contract management, um, and there are um, annual uh, quarterly reviews with all the services to ensure that uh, we monitor impact and make sure that we understand the values and the benefits. So we work with all of our um, services to make sure that we that we set very clear um, outcome frameworks and that we have regular reviews in order to, to monitor those frameworks. I can say with certainty that you know the the the, the work of our, our diversionary services is significant and uh, you know areas that we we continue to support. Thank you very much. So page five, page six, and um, to shut off all the questions. How are the results uh, presented? The results of the, the, the schemes. Yeah. So, so we have um, formal written um, uh, reports presented to the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner and regular reviews <laughs> with our business and finance uh, manager and Sam Slater also attends those uh, but equally some elements like GDAS and um, the other the another significant diversionary scheme our whole system approach around women's justice has had an independent evaluation so we've had an independent evaluation which has overseen the entire uh, program and provided recommendations which has helped inform the new commissioning framework do you want to just take your next question? You have a good six as well. Yes. Um, it was about the uh, intervention that um, helps the, the the perpetrator. Well, I think that's a a, a, a victim of, of domestic abuse myself. I think it's a really positive thing that that this intervention is being put. Forward for the perpetrator, especially seeing, considering they they want to admit that there's a, there's a problem, and that's the first step to change. Thank you. I really appreciate the uh, you know your your question and um, the spirit in terms of recognising the importance of supporting victims, but also recognising we need to prioritise work on perpetrators if we are to really end violence against women. 
we must support victims. But more than that, we must change behaviour so that they don't become victims in the first place. And that's why we absolutely want to support work on perpetrators. Uh, we have funded work with perpetrators for a number of years, um, and, but this is a real renewed effort to work with our colleagues in Gwent Police to understand what are the interventions that will change behaviour, uh, both in terms of high-risk uh, perpetrators, but also um, medium and low-risk perpetrators, but also really thinking about early intervention. <coughs> So we want to understand the whole suite of interventions that we need to be investing in to stop violence against women and girls. And that's why on a national level, we have really pushed Welsh Government to include in its new strategy on ending violence against women and girls a real strand on perpetrator work. We want it to be evidence-based, we want to understand what works, and we want to be able to fund that. We have currently got um, a bid into the Home Office for um, both police uh, support for, for, for funding for police intervention and, uh, uh, and, and also community intervention. But that is the start of the journey. So I think what we recognise is that with our colleagues in local authorities, um, with the Regional Violence Against Women, Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence uh, Regional Board, we need to be really clear on how we co collectively <coughs> invest in appropriate services to, to prevent violence against women and girls. Is there any plans to do anything in the schools? Because obviously it's, <coughs> it's at an early age, the attitudes towards women. Is there any plans to do anything in schools? Absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm really pleased that um, I can share with you that I'm leading for Welsh Government and Policing in Wales a work strand for the Violence Against Women and Girls um, strategy on children and young people. So I want to very much think about children who are impacted by domestic abuse. And, and we need to really develop our services and our support for children who are impacted by domestic abuse. But as you say, then also think about the prevention. So making sure that we really work with children and young people from an early age to understand what is acceptable, unacceptable behaviour. I'm really pleased that the Wales Police Schools programme is critical in helping work with our schools in terms of um, understanding the support we can provide school communities around violence against women and girls. But absolutely, as you say, schools are a vital part and building um, approaches to healthy relationships um, at a very early age is, is significant. One of the things that really concerns me is that we have in England um, uh, the, the Education Inspection, uh, Inspectorate have published a report, Ofsted, into peer-on-peer -peer abuse in, in, in schools. And we have a similar inspection report in, in 2021, um, which again um, shines a spotlight on issues around peer-on-peer -peer abuse in schools. And I think that really is a wake-up call for us all to recognise if we really are serious about tackling violence against women, then actually focusing on what we need to do with children and young people is significant. And that's why you know, the Commissioner is absolutely focused on children and young people in terms of his work and <laughs> A lot of information there, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Jeff, Jeff, I'll have a follow-up. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much. That's great news to hear. It's such a, a, a serious issue, and I was pleased uh, to hear about the, the funding side of it. I think what you alluded to, that that would be a, effectively a grant coming from the Home Office, as opposed to putting further pressures on our uh, budget that is there. But just two follow-up points. You, you've mentioned domestic violence about against uh, women and children. Does this also cover against men? Because it, it isn't just the children yeah. uh, in that regard. And um, would when you talked about going into schools, a lot of, um, in my opinion, uh, some of the starting points for violence later on in life can be bullying in school. So does this uh, what you're alluding to, does this cover the bullying aspect in school? Because that's a breeding ground, in my opinion, and my family having experienced it. Um, would it be covered in that aspect as well? 
think your first point, yes, absolutely. So our work on violence against, our work on violence is for everybody in our communities. We particularly focus absolutely a priority on violence against women because women are by far the, the, the most significant category of victims of violence. Yeah. But that does, doesn't mean that we, we wouldn't, we absolutely take any violence against any member of our community seriously. And we would want to encourage men, women to come forward, to, to report to the police and to, to um, also access services. So certainly in our victim services, we have, you know, representatives who will support all members of the community, um, including particular services for um, LGBT communities as well. So recognising that is, is really important. In terms of schools and bullying, um, absolutely, <clears throat> We need to we need to absolutely focus on issues around bullying. I think that that goes back to my my comments earlier about building um, an understanding with young people at the earlier stage around respectful relationships um, and the the appropriate way of of, uh, of working of, of interacting between um, peers. Um, I think we need to work very closely with our local education authorities. Um, I'm really, again, pleased that we're working with um, all five local authorities around racist bullying, so that we currently have um, a piece of research that has been commissioned jointly funded by the five directors of local authorities, directors of education and ourselves into understanding the incidences of racist bullying and perhaps the reasons why people don't um, report or share um, incidences of bullying. Um, I have had a uh, um, meeting this week, or we had a meeting this week with the Children's Commissioner, and we understand that she is um, she's just concluding some research that she's done in her first term, um, uh, first year of, of her term, into what children and young people see as the critical issues for them. And I understand that bullying will feature significantly. And I think the conversation that we had with the Children's Commissioner was, unfortunately, you know, she is the fourth Children's Commissioner. Each children's commissioner has had bullying identified as a priority for children and young people. So I think it really gives us an opportunity to reflect why we, we still have not made significant impacts, really, in terms of changing the experience of children and young people around bullying, both in schools and in their communities. But I think that is something we have to take you know, take forward together in partnership with our local authorities in terms of understanding. We have a part to play, um, but I don't think we are the first responders, really, in terms of um, helping, but but want to absolutely support our colleagues in education in terms of thinking about the societal attitudes. And just a quick follow-up, um, and obviously bullying when we were in school is now different to, or there is an additional thing called social media now, isn't it? So one assumes that that would be covered in that as well, because I think the social media bullying that's going on at the moment uh, and is it is prevalent. I think we're all aware of that. It's something that uh, you know needs to be high on that priority list as well. Thank you, um, Professor Key. I think um, absolutely the cyber element, the social media element, is really important. But I think one of the things that certainly with the previous <laughs> deputy, uh, deputy chief constable and myself, um, you know, really concerned about the normalisation of very sexualised behaviour. Children, young people. So I think there's, there's the cyber issue, but I think you know recognizing what the, the world that our young people live in at the moment is quite a challenging one for them to navigate, and it's one that I think we need to be supporting children, and young people, but I also think we need to be supporting parents and actually helping parents um, guide their way through you know what are very challenging and difficult circumstances is is something that we need to do collectively with our partners. Thank you very much. I think part of like the education of parents as well, isn't it? Because I know my husband would never do about Snapchat, Instagram, anything like that. So parents might be blissfully unaware actually in some of these cases of, of social media bullying that's, that's going on. Uh, uh, thanks, Jane. Yeah, I think the, the really worrying thing as far as I'm concerned is what youngsters can access on, on the phone. Um, I know a situation just a couple of weeks ago where was a nine-year-old was, um, was going to be playing games which were 18 plus. Um, and, um, 
that this came through a police visit to the school actually asking us some questions. But if, if and he's obviously not there himself, you know, there are lots of others. I mean, he's got a couple of old brothers. They are about 13 or whatever. So none of them really should be on that sort of thing. But it doesn't seem to be any sort of. Uh, I know there are blocks. I know. I know that I'm going to just seems that, um, as the chair just said, people either don't know how to do it or they're not they're not aware of it. And um, you know, really young children we get all the quite a bit of stuff, literally by picking the phone up. And, and I, I don't know how we deal with it. There is a new online safety bill that is currently proceeding through the uh, through Westminster. And one of the issues that it is, it is attempting to do is to actually look at the role and the responsibility of our of the you know the main companies and and, and um, you know uh, to to actually think about how they need to regulate and cons consider access to these sites. But at the moment, the reality is that people do access it despite age limits that might be set on things like Facebook. That children and young people do access, and and you know their their ability to access on phones, computers, and um, things quite significant. Mm -hmm. I remember a number of years ago sitting in a a room like with a consultation with children and young people about social media and how they wanted to be communicated with, and um, you know they were sitting in a school and saying, you know, our school has locked everything down; we're not allowed to access it, and then quickly showed me how that how they could all get around it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the reality. Yeah, it is. And unfortunately, the, the police should, I'm not sure that down the line, there's so many organisations that need to be in the system of health and prevention before it, it gets to behave that becomes to the attention of the police, isn't it? So, you know, it is a huge, a huge issue and a huge public issue. It's what? <laughs> because it's all or nothing. You put the filters on to stop your trial and it blocks out most of the stuff. They hardly have access to anything. They, they get annoyed and they take the filters off. They can't hardly access anything because the filters are all, all or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to find a point before we move Yeah, on? just so what you mentioned there, Lady, the, the social media companies don't seem to yeah. take any responsibility. There was a case I know, fully recently where Facebook or one of them just disclaimed any responsibility of what was going on. Yeah. Difficult and a huge issue, and one I'm sure we'll talk about many times over the following meetings. Okay, moving on. Then. Any press? Uh, oh, okay, sorry, can't say Carry on. But, um, it is related to serious, serious violence. I, I want to give some examples because I was trying to understand what the local authority involvement was. Do riots, I think. So the serious violence duty is a new um, is a new duty on um, which is discharged through uh, police and crime commissioners, um, and our role is to coordinate activity at a local level. So Sam, on the commissioner's behalf, is convening um, our our local authority partners and health into <coughs> working out what it is that we need to be doing on the floor to deliver the serious violence duty. Serious violence duty is being like, my view is, you know, all violence is serious. So I think it is about considering what we need to uh, do in terms of, of serious violence. There is no particular definition of serious violence, but it is talking about, in particular, things like life crime and, and, and issues around, um, um, you know, gangs and knives. And knives. So we, we are convening people our partners together to look at what we need to do. Part of that is it, the first step is absolutely about understanding what the issues are. So some of, some of the work that we will be doing is working with partners to truly understand what are the incidences of violence in, in our communities in Gwent, and then to think about what are the um, solutions that we need to be putting in place with people. Some of that is about making sure that this is a partnership um, so we have worked on serious and organised crime with our partners in local authorities previously and making sure that we work, work with the police and local authorities is really important. Raising awareness with partners about some of the dangers, some of the risks, 
and making sure that we have those really strong connections is really important. Some of the things that we might be funding through the, the, the additional money that we're getting, and again, um, you know, it is additional uh, fun funding that's coming through the Home Office into Gwent, will be um, a more analysis. So one of the one of the really interesting elements is about do we really understand police data and do we map that across with health data? And Sometimes when you put those two together, they actually are, are focusing on different elements. So we might be seeing significant incidents of reporting to police of incidents, but actually the A&E data might be telling us something very different about where people are perhaps being injured and harmed. So actually doing some work about making sure we've got a much better way of, of partners working together to understand the data, understand the analysis, and then put our collective effort into what we need to do is, is a significant element. The other thing, obviously, though, is we want to make a direct impact into our communities. So we already have a really strong working relationship with St Giles. Um, and fearless. St. Giles providing support for young people who are um, <coughs> exploited, who may be involved in violence and in potentially drug dealing, and actually trying to support them to um, find alternative ways and, and provide interventions. But fearless also goes back to your point and, and Tony's point around schools. Um, fearless is very much about, which is fearless is the, the crime stoppers for young people. So it's part of crime stoppers, but it's actually a fearless is branded specifically for young people. And it's about providing that confidential space for young people to find out about the dangers of violence and life crime to take action um, but be supported into how to have a <coughs> trusted adult that they can confide in if they're worried about any issues in their communities. Training for the, the councillors or for, for the local authority to um, if to look out for si certain signs that would lead to like a, a clue that something may happen. Absolutely, it's a really important point and certainly one that Sam I would expect us to, to, to see coming through. <laughs> We did a, a significant um, training program, a multi agency training program for partners, for local authorities, and councillors around <laughs> the, the dangers and spotting the signs. And actually, one of the most effective elements of that training was that we had somebody called Junior Smart, who was an ex gang member um, from, from, from um, Fearless actually come and actually talk about his experience um, and, and the the ways that people perhaps find themselves involved in serious and organized crime and serious violence and unknowingly um, having been drawn into it and i think it's really important that we equipped you know counselors and partners in understanding what those signs are so sam i think it's it's a really important part <coughs> Got that work on serious violence, but we make sure that we have that awareness raising and that um, training element. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion on those topics. Um, moving on to page eight, um, Councillor Easton and then Councillor Mack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Page eight just states there are two paragraphs and set some alarms out for you in my in my mind. And so we're dealing member of the state strategy, member of the European Finance and Finance. Um, you say that you signed, you signed off the um, recommendation of the state strategy in January and February, so you're looking to attract another one now. So we move on to where we are at the moment. Um, we couldn't, many of us couldn't come to a public event in Cumbrand for whatever reasons. And that seems to have alarmed myself because a lot of the I was not aware of, never been aware of. Uh, I, I was a little bit more concerned about what you could have done the ground uh, depot rather than the development. And you say it wasn't a form of public consultation, <coughs> but the impression that members of the public got it, it was priming the public into a consultation. I think that the state strategy 
and the state's body and the finance group have been left behind on this and does give me concerns that this action will be taken in absence in absentia of the members which we which are that could have been there because I believe that um, we all felt um, left behind on this one. That's the best way I can put it. Um, so I, I think we need to have from yourselves reasons why you carried out this council. I use the word consultation, yeah, because it's not a public consultation. Why the form of that session took place to give the impression to the public of what you want to do in the future, despite the fact that we've not, as a body, <laughs> agreed and approved it. So that's my main concern, and I think that'll announce that I'll have comments to make about that. Second one is this police station Abergrenny. Now, I know it's a land choice. Can you really tell me? That the police officers will walk from that point into that any town centre. No, we don't. Um, I, I know what it's there for. It was put there for as a hub, as part of the scheme of hubs across the county. It's the first one to cover the last one. Um, but I think we've got to start start selling the police the presence out of ready in a different format. Please, please, President Abbott Rennie will not, I, think, I believe, be focused on what Lamp Hoist did. Lamp Hoist, therefore, other purposes, which I took this award, but the town, the town of Abbott Rennie is at the moment it's supported by um, support at the, at the, at the town hall. Uh, yeah. so that, that's, a, that's a minor concern, but the major concern is, is, is about the escape strategy. And uh, I, I'd like some responses. I, I was a sole member of that. I watched it go through, and this was never really part of the benefit moving forward until we, we pick this up to the public. We couldn't get there for whatever reason, but then the fact we've been sidestepped seems a bit nasty. <coughs> so firstly, can I apologize that you know the, the, the you as the, the remaining member of the estate subgroup, that you as a panel don't feel engaged with us. And that's something that the commissioner um, has absolutely focused on uh, making sure that we rectify that, um, that uh, Darren will be putting a, a finance and estates meeting in a, as soon as practically possible so that we are able to um, brief you and in particular make sure that those meetings happen on a regular basis. It's really important that we are uh, proactive with this committee uh, with this panel in terms of understanding what the vision for the estate is and what the plans for the estate are over the next uh, few few well, over the next um, uh, the next few years but also for the long term and I think what's really important is that we understand what those operational demands are I think there are two aspects of this committee that this panel are absolutely um, I think rightly concerned about one, as we heard in the Chief's presentation in December, the concern about the risk to the <coughs> about not having the suitable estate and infrastructure in order for the Chief Constable to, die, to deliver her policing services. But the second is the affordability. And I think the affordability is the area that obviously really concerns yourselves as the panel um, in terms of you know, having a very ambitious strategy, but actually we, we can't deliver an ambitious strategy if it's unaffordable. So that's been the challenge for us. So uh, I can give you my assurance, uh, Councillor Issa, that there will be a, um, a meeting to properly bring things together. Um, I think we recognise that we didn't um, engage uh, as, as appropriately as we should have in relation to the uh, um, event around the Gwent operational police facility. Um, and, and that's something we will, we will seek to provide. But what I would say is no firm decisions have been made in relation to that site as yet. So the, the process is, as you are aware, that the figures um, were included in the budget figures. They are in the medium term financial plan. Um, but, but as yet, they have not been formally um, taken a, a decision on. So the, the, the event, as you quite rightly said, was not a public consultation event, but it was a pre-consultation um, event. event. Yeah, to, en to enable people to start to understand that that's one of the options that is being considered. It is the vague option at the moment in terms of looking at the alternatives, but those are exactly the questions that you are wanting us to answer. So I know that you want to, you requested the business case 
you uh, wanted to understand what those imperative options are. And I think that's why we need to spend some time with you going through all of the options so that you can understand why that currently is the preferred option. But at the moment, we haven't been able to proceed. And I think at the last meeting, we did have the discussion about what we don't want to do is when the time comes that we can actually afford to move forward in terms of that, that we, have, we, we haven't we have done the planning. So what is happening at the moment is the planning stage is to lead us up to the point where we can then um, so press go as and when the affordability comes into play. Um, so, so, you know, have this. I, I know that we recognise the need to bring the estate strategy group and the finance strategy group together for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in my view as a member of the estate group. I don't know what the rest of the colleague might feel about this, but um, I, I want it to set the land out so that I've lose my mind. And the figures that we came out with, and I won't mention them because I'm not sure whether they're factual or not, which is big capital expenditure to do what we need to do. And the question would be, well, where is that capital expenditure coming from? So really and truly, we do feel let down. Um, and personally, I hope that I'm not sure I'll be the next time. I'm not sure what's happening. But um, make make sure that we are putting screen on these things. We are because it's, a, it's an important decision to make. There's a lot of a lot of concerns within the county, the county of Gwent about how these things are actually taking place. For example, in my own area, we have a letter from Ram, who is a way, two bus routes, two or three bus routes. Inclusion, inclusion of the, the police for the local people is very important. <coughs> and I'm just like you now, I've put it in one place, in, in Cumbran, for example, maybe the right decision, but it will leave the likes of seven side, the Calibre, Bigger, and the out in the cold. Because we find that now, initially on the estate group, it was going to be a set of hubs across the county. A hub one hub is with Matt Voist, another hub would have been somewhere around Vega, and you're looking to have possible some minor hub in the Monmouth area. I won't talk about this, this side of the county, I'm talking about the Monmouth side of the county, where there would, would be an inclusion, but we find that we're not. There's no inclusion in the police. We're missing out. And I'd like to talk about that with myself because I feel that it's important for that area. And maybe us as well. I, I can't talk about Mama, but I, I know I'm living well. I can see the disparity of the fact that we're not getting police service from one of those areas from the policies that you put forward for the hubs, which I thought was the way forward. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. So can I invite Councillor Mann and then followed by Councillor Keir and then final comment from Councillor Shackham Dawson, please. First of all, apologies, Chair, I may be repeating something and I recognise what the lady has said in, in response. But, you know, I, I read that the Chief and the Commissioner signed off the recommendations of the review. I then read it's not been approved eternally, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. internally, sorry. Um, and they're then talking about whether, it's, whether it is viable and if there's a proper business case. Now, when I saw that invitation to what is called here an engagement event. I was amazed. I didn't realise anything had been going on. And uh, in fact, uh, I think I expressed my thoughts in the email that I sent in response. I, I did wonder what the function of this panel is. Because quite honestly, we were expressing concerns in various meetings along the line, and then suddenly we're confronted with this. We, we haven't got the money to do it. May have sometime in the future. Is, is, that, is that likely? No, I always remember being told that um, we're going to have a police headquarters, a slim down police headquarters, and then this thing was going to be decentralised through the through wet, the whole area of wet, not one little bit. Because um, uh, um, <laughs> Tony uh, has, has, has already said how far they feel away. In Mega from from Cumbran. how far do people in this area still away from Cumbran? You know, it's a heck of a lot. It's a heck of a lot further. But Gwent Police is supposed to be covering the whole of Gwent. The uh, Gwent Police presence in the centre of the main town of Cavalli is a closed a closed shop, which was open for I think eleven months. That is the police presence in the in the centre of the apart from 
officers of order and public safety. <laughs> the actual, the actual police presence is a closed shop in Cardiff Road. I, think I, want to I, I do want to come back because I think I think the police presence is <laughs> you just are our officers, are our PCSOs, are our staff who are in our communities. And I think the estate is is a it is the vehicle by which we facilitate our officers on the street. And I think what I wouldn't want us to detract is to say that you know, Kefili is closed. It's not closed to those officers who are in our communities and who are working in our communities. The the function of the buildings should be there to deliver the service and not to be the building in itself. Well, I recognise that, Lily, and by the same token, what do we gain by spending 55 million quid uh, on, on the summer income brand when we've already got police headquarters? Police presence should be on the street. <laughs> Not in a fifty-five million pound building in the in the center. And that, that's why we need to bring. You know, so you know, really, uh, the logic of this, and if we have a function as a panel, let's be included. Absolutely. Not 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 have discussions. There's something else going on somewhere else because that's what's happened here. So we we've been having discussions, and other people have been having discussions, which is what they want to do regardless. And, and that's the way, that's the message that comes over to me. But if I've got it wrong, apologies. So that is the message that's come over to me, and I hope it's wrong. The, Commissioner, the Deputy Commissioner would like to respond to that, and then we'll take Councillor Keir's question. Yeah, I apologise for the fact that you, you feel in that way, and I, I, we will do our best to rectify that by being proactive and working with you so that we can explain and take the view of the, what the, the purposes are. One of the issues um, about the, the facility that, that is being discussed is a, a new custody facility that would be for the whole of Wales um, and that, that by, by the very nature needs to be of a particular um, a particular build and a, a particular location. Uh, but that is the detail that we need to make sure that we share with you. And I apologise that that hasn't happened today. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, yes, first of all, thank you for that apology. Um, Two, like Councillor Easton said, was concerned, uh, Councillor Mann as well, about this very short um, notice of this event. And I think this whole process that we've been discussing over the last series of meetings, and which is culminating, I think, for today about joining up finance this state is, is, is a welcome. My concerns have been throughout all of this is putting the cart before the horse and that what's been presented to us is a fait accompli. Absolutely do get requirements that the chief has said about operational issues, failing facilities that are not fit for future. However, as we have laboured on, cost of this is significant and it has to be joined up. What concerns me also is that you know, this report makes reference to the Chief Constable and I signed off the recommendations of the Estate Strategy Review in February. Seen anything to that effect? And also, this is now making reference to a revised version. So this is the first time that, that we've, see, we've seen this. My recollection of previous meetings was that we as a, as, as a committee have not been uh, or have not been satisfied with the um, strategy, have not been sufficiently involved with the strategy as a whole to understand, and some of these comments have been coming out and they came out of previous meetings about police in, 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 in Councillor Easton's part of the world, whether it's Cumbran, whether it's right. I still don't know that is the right philosophy or, or whether you know what are the arguments for this central thing we're then being asked to consider it in the in the mid to financial long-term plan i get that and i argued for the fact that it should be ready to come off the shelf when the funding is arrived so i welcome your apology because i think it's an acknowledgement of the discussions that there has been some failures here and our job as a panel is to give you that feedback. So I do welcome this joining up of the estates and finance, but I also say please do involve us at an early stage as, as possible. Thank you. 
You're absolutely, I mean, without wanting to repeat myself, absolutely, you know, we will be proactive and we will take this forward with you. And, and it's a, you know, it's an important, we, we do value the role of this panel. Um, so I don't want the panel to feel that they are being sidelined or not being included. Um, Darren, I don't know if you want to come in and say Yes. Thank, thank you all for a very useful conversation, actually, with Larry. Um, my apologies for any failings in the system today. Just want to provide a bit of clarity on, on the, the separation of the estate strategy review and the GPOF piece. So I think I, I've heard today sometimes they, they're brought together. So the estate strategy was reviewed at the request of the panel in January 22 when we presented a, a financial plan then. And I think the panel suggested quite rightly that we review the estate strategy of that whole document, which we commenced um, last April. Uh, and we did a series of engagement events. We did a public consultation on it. We did a, pub, uh, a panel presentation on it. We did all the uh, subject matter experts. So we did a series of, um, of check-ins with key stakeholders around the validity. Took us a, a significant amount of time because we thought we would use these summer engagement events to really get the public view on the validity and the direction of travel that that needs to state strategy. That all came to a conclusion in November. After internal governance purposes, in February, the recommended recommended changes to the estate strategy were approved in February. That's the come on myself and my force colleagues to redraft that. So that's what we're doing now around the overarching state strategy, which has the phases, which still hasn't had the spoke model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and must be written in the context quite clearly of the affordability concerns we've had. So I, th I think we had this dynamic if we had a strategy that was totally unaffordable. So how do you merge the two? Within that strategy was, was the wet police operation facility, which we'd also agreed at the panel meeting that with a fair wind on the affordability front, we should get our ducks lined up to press go on that at a point in the future. Um, and I met with Treasury Management Advisors yesterday to see the the board, the panel, to see the long-term effect on interest rates is a borrowing piece, and they are coming down in the medium term, which which, which trust you will know. So there is a fair wind approaching, but you'll appreciate we, we discussed the panel back in January that we would proceed to the pre-construction phases. So at a point when it becomes affordable, then we can press go. So that is still <coughs> two years hence because it's going to be two years until interest rates get anywhere near what we could even dream of, of, of investing in. So I think it's just key that we separate the strategy. So the, the revised strategy will come to the panel, full panel at the next meeting. It'll go to the combined finance and safety group before that. We will also build a separate meeting within the next week, uh, about six weeks to, to, to tackle this particular issue and bring panel members up on some of the details. So uh, uh, an extraordinary meeting, if you will, beyond the finance subgroup, we have four panels just to bring it to speed and address, you know, the, the, the clear frustrations at the end of the day. Uh, so we can bring it to speed with GPOF and also the state strategy. We rest assured you will see the state strategy as revised in June. And you will have that further clarity on what sits below that, the GPOF uh, build and the timeline and what we the stage we're currently at uh, at an extraordinary meeting, if that if that if that's okay to panel members. Thank you. I think Rather than taking any more points on this, just to say this, Chair, we fully endorse what the panel members yeah. are saying and the frustration that came following that invitation um, was evident through the majority of panel members. I think we need understanding of the state strategy before June, because if we're looking to progress with the GPOC bill, how do we know that fits with the state strategy? We don't. So I think that we need to get a few things in mind, the state strategy being the key one, the, the GPOC business case to understand the logic and the choice and the alternative options that were, were available. I think the concern for panel members is unfortunately we were unable to attend, but a member who hopefully will be joining the panel soon did go and provide you feedback and the detail of the feedback he provided in terms of who was at the session, who, uh, the, the, the type of building, the number of cells that were going to be held, that, that was a real shock to us because we had no understanding in, in respect of that. So um, I really appreciate your honesty today. I really appreciate your um, apology to the members. Um, and I'd like to hope that it will go now 
um, forward. We'll have these meetings and actually it'll start to put some members' minds at rest and we'll be far more fully informed. One of the new members has suggested that we put together a synopsis of the, of the time scale. So there's a lot of people on the panel who don't appreciate the journey that we've been through. So I think between us, um, perhaps Tony and Colin, um, as some of the longer serving members on the panel who've been through the estate strategy, can help us pull that together. Okay, so thank you. I'm, I'm going to move on from this. I now. Just, just one question about Darren, about Darren said, which brings the ducks in line. <clears throat> when we met as an estate strategy, the intention was to demolish the building. Well, I would have to ask that. Um, wouldn't matter. Uh, what it what, what matter in one way. Are you still going to demolish the building? Okay, thank you, Councillor Sinclair. We'll wrap this one up there. There's no further questions then on the um, on the Ethics and Crime Commission's update. So thank you for that and thank you for the full responses. Uh, agenda item is tonight. There are no questions to the Ethics and Crime Commission for this meeting. So moving on to agenda item six. Um, a presentation on police complaints <laughs> to um, Inspector Holly Corley and BSI something. Thank you both very much. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, good morning, all. Um, obviously, as Head of Professional Standards in Gwent, I, I oversee four distinct but interlinked areas. So I look after police misconduct, counter corruption, vetting, and the area that Holly's responsible for, which is complaints and discipline. I know as a panel, over the last few meetings, you've been interested in, in that complaints procedure and how that dovetails into the OPCC around reviews. Um, so Holly's prepared a short presentation for you today, which she'll go through and hopefully provide you with that oversight as to, as to the process and, and how that works. Just to say, I was going to bring the physical copy of the complaints regulations in today, but I realised we've only got two and a half, three hours. It was a, it was a long journey from the car, and I'm not the biggest man anyway, so to carry it up. So, so if Holly is a Holly and Sean are able to distill this down into into 20 minutes, I'll be really impressed. But obviously, um, Holly, if you'd yeah. like to stay over now, and um, as I said, if there's any questions throughout, either for myself or Holly, please shout up, or if we want to do that at the end, that's fine. But um, thank you, Chair. Off stand, if that's okay. Um, you're not an agent to view or anything. Lovely. Okay, so um, as um, Superintendent Payne said, uh, my name is Holly Corley. Um, I am one of the inspectors within our professional standards department. So my key roles and responsibilities are really overseeing um, performance related complaints. Um, it's obviously a really important piece of work for us as Gwent Police. We want to know where we're going wrong, how we can put things right, and therefore improve. Um, our performance and our and our confidence really in the community. Um, as the super says, um, it's it's a bit of a legal minefield. Um, there's there's a lot to it. It's largely underpinned um, from Schedule Three of the Police Reform Act, and then there's lots of supplementary guidance and legislation which kind of governs how we respond, um, how we handle complaints. Um, and how we look to get it right. So that the main piece of legislation around that is the statutory guidance, which is provided by the IOPC. Um, there's obviously other, other bits of legislation there, and they're just some of them. Um, so I think what's really important to take from that is that our need to really work collaboratively um, and rely on experts because with the best will in the world, we can't know all of that inside out. So we're looking to experts, we're looking to our partners to be able to get the our responses right and to be able to deliver the right service. Um, next slide. Um, the IOPC guidance is really clear um, and promotes an accessible complaint system in that it needs to capture um, the breadth of the community. So, you know, it's all very well and good to have an access to, through social media, um, through digital platforms, but not everybody has got access to those. Um, and in order for us to kind of really take the learning forward, oh, it's all there. Um, I think if you press that little cut, um, I, don't, I just don't know whether it's going to help you. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's not the far. Yeah, it's going across. Oh. So. Um, what was I saying? I've lost my, lost my train of thought. <laughs> accessible service. Right, okay. So, um, it needs to reflect the needs and expectations and the rights of the complainant. So what we thought was really important for us here is that we, we're capturing everybody's views. And we can only do that if we're obviously just taking correspondence to people who've got access to social media platforms, then we're going to get one type of feedback because we're looking invariably at a smaller type of criminality. So it, it needs to be reflective. 
Um, we're also doing a lot of work at the moment um, around reasonable adjustments um, and really promote interest from our BAME and LGB communities who reported that they feel a lack of confidence in the system. So that is very much an ongoing process. Um, next slide, please. So how that translate for, translates for us locally in Gwent and, and our own landscape. Um, obviously, the, the most used one um, is going to be through our websites, our campaign portal. Um, within a touch of a button, you're there and you can submit a complaint um, and you can, you know, you've got a response within a really, really short time frame. Um, the, the other option, which some of our higher demand user tend to have higher demand drivers tend to use, apologies, is our PSD um, email box. And we'll also see quite a lot of correspondence coming in through members of staff through that option. Um, you can also report your complaints through 101 or the social media desk, and you can also report in person um, to a member of staff or to an officer. Um, as a bit of a question, the IOPC will say that you can take your complaint directly to them. However, unless those exceptional circumstances apply, um, they're going to refer it back to us. So we will openly promote um, that you actually bring it to us in the first instance. And if we need to refer it to the IOPC for that transparency, then we will do. Um, next slide. Um, so who can complain and what can they complain about? So that is it's a public <coughs> service essentially. Um, and you, you've got to you've got to satisfy a certain criteria and able to, to be able, sorry, to lodge a complaint. And is any expression of dissatisfaction, it doesn't need to be at the top end of things, it can be you know relating to communication, uh, missing property, it can be anything. So it's any expression of dissatisfaction um, by or on behalf of a member of the public and they need to meet the definition of a complainant. Now not everybody satisfies that and you need to either be directly affected, adversely affected, a witness or on behalf of somebody else. Um, so if you were to see something in the press or if you'd overheard something from a friend or a neighbour um, and you had taken um, exception to the behaviour of an individual within the organisation, you can't really complain about it. You need to have been affected or acting on behalf or a witness to that incident. And um, that's in relation to uh, performance of an individual. When we're talking about the bigger issues, the organisational issues and the more strategic issues surrounding the complaints framework, then you just need to satisfy these two here, which is adversely affected or acting on behalf of somebody else. Uh, if you don't fit it, you know, you can still correspond with us. We'll give you an answer. We'll make a we'll we'll document it. We'll record it, and we'll give you an update. It doesn't mean that if you want to talk to us about something that you can't, you know, we'll take that on board, um, and we'll look to resolve it for you in any case. Uh, next slide, please. So who deals with the complaint? Um, so as I've said, this is this is kind of my side of the house over here, um, and we will deal with lower level issues, so performance. Um, and kind of low, yeah, performance related issues. Um, what will happen is you will express your dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction through one of the mediums that we've discussed, and then that will come into our complaints assessors. They are, there's only two of them. Um, and, you know, when we think about the number of complaints, we can really see how efficient and effective they are at actually processing our complaints. Um, they will Firstly, decide whether you've got eligibility to make a complaint. Secondly, then they'll go through what it is that you want to complain about and what it is ultimately as a member of the public that you want to see as a resolution to that complaint. And that can be really creative depending upon what it is the complaint sign centres around. They'll then send it through to myself and I'll make a decision then really um, if, it, if it falls into something that needs to be investigated about whether that's performance whether it sits with us or whether it's actually a little bit more serious and it needs to go over to Simon and his team um, to, to look at if it falls into what we think is conduct or gross misconduct. Um, we are very much held together <coughs> with our admin and vetting, um, as you would well imagine, who do who kind of make sure that all of that is pieced together properly. Uh, next slide. Um, this is, this is um, yeah, it, it can be murky. <laughs> yeah. So we've got one to the left, really. So you fall, you fall into two main, what we call them, the, the, the buckets in the complaints framework. Um, and we 
really important to schedule three. So as a complainant, you have got that rubber stamp, that right of approval is your statutory right, and you can have that review through it, Charlotte, and take you through the report later. Um, or we can put it into a non-schedule three, which is your lower level, quick resolutions, giving a message to somebody, chasing something up. Um, and that is the, the bulk of the work for us, really, and thankfully. Um, and that is pretty much handled by our complaint successors. Um, I have heard some really creative um, outcomes with that legend, has it, that um, somebody has had their council tax refunded for the case and contributions somewhere in the country. I don't think it was actually, it wasn't working. It wasn't here. <laughs> it wasn't here. <laughs> Please don't relay that. <laughs> <laughs> But I think what I'm trying to get across here is that we can be really creative. There's no set, we're not confined, there's no parameters. As long as our complainants are satisfied with the outcome that we've offered without the need of a formal investigation, then we're happy with that because they're happy. And we've obviously taken the learning on board. Um, schedule threes then, these require, like I said, investigations. They'll sit with our sergeants. And we also, there's... Uh, you know, I can kind of act as a safety net there. So you might know some complainants will come, come through, they're reporting something that actually we really need to know about and it needs to be taken further, but they might be of the view, well, actually, I told you, I don't really want to do anything about this. Well, I've got the authority there to say, actually, we, we really need to, um, and we can look to, a, you know, to, to take those matters further. Um, it goes without saying that if any of these complaints have resulted in a death or a serious injury, if there's any criminal offences, human rights breaches or anything like that, then we will obviously record them in line with the policy. Uh, next slide. That's just to, to really hit home what the difference is um, between our Schedule threes and our non Schedule threes is, is that right of review, which I'm going to a little bit later. Next one. We'll do the next one because I'm not going to be that. But I think you get the gist of it. Um, so referrals to the IOPC then. So as I said, um, we will promote um, an accessible system and we will take those complaints on board um, and, and invariably handle them ourselves. But however, there are some occasions where they need to be referred to the IOPC for transparency um, so that we can reassure our members of the, of, of the public and the communities um, that, that there is there's a website and that you know nothing is being necessarily withheld so they will fall into serious assaults sexual offenses and um, things like corruption criminal offenses um that are appended really with uh, <coughs> discriminatory behavior relevant offenses um and then um anything really that, that you know um content falling within any of the above so um next slide the IOPC, as I said, will be clear um, that they've got a statutory duty here to secure and maintain public confidence. Um, and, and that is why, essentially, the bottom line on, on why we refer them in. They'll then make a decision if it meets any of those criteria, um, whether, the, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, they'll apply a mode of investigation, it's a better way to say it, it's written there, um, about whether it needs to be a local investigation or handled by us. Um, whether they need to direct that investigation, but it'll still be conducted by Grant Police, or whether they need to handle that independently. Um, they will let us know, they'll let the complainers know, and then we'll keep a record of it. The next slide. Um, so complaint outcomes then. Um, like I said, th this is our um, this is our creativity box. Um, and, and, and it's a lot smaller. Anything that we reported in Chesterfield 3 then, a report is sent to myself, and I'll make a decision about whether we think the service provided by Gwen Police is acceptable, whether it's unacceptable, or whether, based on the evidence that we've been able to collate, we can't possibly say. Um, regardless of that, we will still look to apply um, an outcome, and they range. Um, I, say, I say in severity, but really in, in what it is that we're trying to achieve. So, you know, if we've got somebody maybe who, for all intents and purposes, falls into this box, but looking at their previous history within the complaints framework, if maybe it's the second, third, fourth occasion, then we'll look to do something a bit more holistic with them and apply one of these outcomes so that we can say that we're doing everything that we can to develop that individual um, and also that we're not repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Um, ultimately, I think what that ties in with there is it needs to be reasonable and it needs to be proportionate. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so timeliness then, and this is the last kind of bit from me really. Um, I think one of our thematic trends and patterns um, around frequency or, or the volume of complaints, I should say, on frequency is timeliness. And that's something that we're really working on together, right? The IOPC are very clear um, in that this is something that from a complaints perspective, we need to get right. Because invariably, if our complainants are coming through because they haven't had an update or um, their case has gone statute barred, or if there's been a lack of communication or a lack of understanding around, it, around an outcome, for example, and then we really need to make sure but as that next, that we, that we get this right. So once we put it onto Schedule 3, um, our complainants need to be updated every four weeks. Um, goes without saying that failure to do that is only going to really in, kind of intensify or kind of contribute to a problem that we've already got. So we're not solving anything. Um, I think if, if you know in, in looking at our, our numbers for this year this quarter i think we're looking at around um a hundred and i knew i should have put it on the slide i checked it before we started um i think we're looking at around 140 um, and around 40 percent of those are recorded to schedule three which i think year on year we're seeing a slight increase in those but i think that's really important it's not necessarily because we're getting more wrong um, it could be our establishment figures have gone up, and um, so we need to be cognizant of that. Um, and you know, with, with that is naturally going to be a, a wider margin for error. Um, but also because our reporting mechanisms are better, um, and we've got a lot more accessibility to the system, and we've done a lot internally to promote how we access that system so that we can basically um, improve that learning and, and our performance. Um, that, that's it for, for my little part. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sean, and then there's, if there's any questions kind of collectively across both, then we can look to do them at the end, if that's okay. Oh, can, I, can I just remind everybody that I know some of that's really difficult to read because of where we're at, but they yeah. were circulated for members last yeah. night, yeah. so they, they are there for your reference, okay? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah well, Sean's just setting herself. I just thought it's, it's worth pointing out from, from our point of view within Gwent, obviously Holly and her team are quite unique amongst the 43 forces in England and Wales. We, we have a central complaints and dissatisfaction team, and what that gives us is a consistency of approach. Um, with other forces, what tends to happen is they come into a central pool and then are dealt with the different areas and different departments. Lots of other forces don't get that consistency, don't get that central lessons learned, which Holly and the team are able to do. So I think it's really, really worth pointing that out in regards to that, because it is quite unique and we, we do invest in that, so it's good. Sorry, Sean. Really helpful. Thanks, Holly. Um, obviously, I'm not Joanne Wiegand, but um, she's our head of insurance compliance. She's done all of the work in preparing um, this presentation and her notes, which I have. And she's very sorry she can't make it, but I'll do my best to cover what that we do. So I have oversight of the role in relation to complaints reviews. And um, you know, we work really closely with uh, Sam and the team there to, to make sure that the system is, is right for everybody involved. So, um, as Holly mentioned, the legislation change actually in February 2020, but it, it happened as a result of the uh, Police and Crime Act of, uh, of 2017. Though so some of people, some of the panel who've been around for a while will know we gave you updates, we made a decision at that time. There were three models that commissioners' offices could have gone for. We went for a model one, which is partly why the team that Sam just mentioned we used some of our previously held public response unit within the OPCC to support the force in setting up that, that unit from a funding perspective and a, you know, and a, um, a resource perspective as well. So it's, it's been really <laughs> awesome to do that work together. Um, as mentioned, the, the IOPC statutory guidance sets out um, what we need to do. We've, we've obviously set our local policies and procedures about how we do it. But um, that's absolutely that's also very much supported by the IOPC. So the changes were really meant to make the complaint system far more customer focused. And um, you know, it was a bit sort of, as, as Sam said, a huge amount of documentation, which it still is, but it is somewhat easier to understand than it was under the old sort of 2015 version that um, is, you know, it's very much like a, a document that we that we still, you know, use all the time, but I wouldn't suggest anyone sort of read their way through it page by page. So that made commissioners' offices the relevant review body for, um, for complaints. 
So previously that work was you know, undertaken by the head of professional standards. And um, at that time, there were probably 20 something a year, maybe something along those lines. Um, but that's gone up quite dramatically over, you know, over the time that they've come. There was a suggestion that the perception would be that it wasn't independent enough of the head of a department sort of doing, a, doing an, an appeal or review of it of their, of their own department. So, so that's why they came over to um, to commissioners' offices. But still, as mentioned with the complaints, IOPC is still the relevant um, body for any more serious complaints. And those are set out, the criteria for those are set out in the guidance. So the right of review, as mentioned, um, if any complaint has been recorded under that Schedule 3, then that can come to our office. They've got the, that complainant has a right to send in a review to us. Um, and that, that uh, you know, right to apply for, for review, um, if that's where it's been investigated or handled otherwise uh, by investigation. Um, if it's, you know, there is no right to review, as Molly said, it's handled outside of that. Um, but what we look at is whether or not the way in which it was handled and the outcome was reasonably proportionate. And that's actually, in the beginning, we sort of struggled a little bit that that wasn't defined. But when we put that to practice, it is very much what most people would consider to be reasonable and proportionate. So we can take those decisions based on what I, we'd like to think a lot of people would, would feel the same way. And there are, um, you know, there are sort of the outcomes available uh, that, uh, you know, that result as a, as a relation, in relation to those that I'll come on to in a minute. So when we receive a review request, which has to come into us in writing, obviously email is the main, main way in which that comes to us. So the complainant will have received their, their outcome letter from, from work police, and it will say at the bottom that you have a right to review, and here's the details, and, and that's how you contact them. So we need to then do specific checks to make sure that it's a valid, a valid review. So have they had that complaint outcome letter? Have they submitted it, that to us in time? We do have some flexibility um, in relation to that, but as a rule, we don't we don't need it. It does tend to come in. And is it right that we are the relevant review body? And in the main, it, it has been us. There have been a couple that we've had to refer to the IOPC um, for them to look at, but as a rule, we have been the, the um, you know, the, the correct review body. We've, got, we've only done that twice, I believe. So uh, that um, those things have been handed over. So once we've confirmed that it's a valid review, we acknowledge that to the complainant, um, and we ask PSD to send over the complaints file. They have five working dates to send that. Um, you know, they, they do come very quickly because obviously the school comes in place are really, really good and, and comprehensive. And then we actually, when we receive that review documentation, we do send it to an external investigation um, or the organisation called SANCUS. So there's a number of us um, within uh, within commissioners' offices who use the organisation SANCUS. We find them incredibly helpful. So they don't make any decisions. What they do is review all of the documentation, and that could be some. You know, we can we can handle some ourselves. They sort of just a series of correspondence within, with, between web police and a, um, and a complainant. Other ones can be absolutely <clears throat> overwhelming amounts of information. So, for example, body one video, um, interview notes, uh, as well as the correspondence and everything else. And, and that's where we would say we're probably not the most qualified to make a judgment on some of those things. So the people who work at Sankers, and we've been through a, we've you know been through a proper sort of contract process uh, with North Wales Commissioner's Office and Dublin Powers Commissioner's Office. So we've got a contract along with them for Sankers. A lot of them are former police officers who've worked in the area of police complaints and standards. So they, they are the experts and then they give us some recommendations that, uh, that you know, we really value and um, we can use those to help us inform our decisions. I had a little bit covering some of that. But, um, but yeah, they get back to us within, within 21 working days. Um, like that like says it in, in the presentation, they just make a recommendation. And we don't always agree with them. Sometimes we do take a different view. We sometimes are able to take local context into account. Um, there, there are a few things that we can take into account before we make a decision. 
complainant and officers in the same way as as uh, during the actual complaint process, they receive um, an, um, uh, an update every 28 days. So we make sure that that, uh, that timeliness is also met from the perspective of, um, of, of when they're at the review stage as well as at the complaint stage as well. I know, I know previously you, um, yourself as a panel have given feedback about we needed to put more resource into handling complaints, and that is something that we've, we've now done. So um, we're advertising at the moment for a standards of governance officer will give us additional support to, to do this work, but we absolutely did take on board your feedback previously and um, acknowledge that we needed to, to resource this area. So um, when conducting the review, the, um, we need to understand fully, so as the complaint being fully understood, all the concerns addressed, have all reasonable lines of inquiry uh, been made in order to ensure that outcome is reasonable and proportionate. Was relevant guidance considered? Um, is there anything that wasn't addressed, any lines of inquiry that weren't pursued? And basically, was the information and evidence weighed uh, appropriately and fairly? And therefore, do the outcomes um, do they logically follow what, what we found from that? And, and that basically gives an opportunity to look at that, whether it's really <coughs> an opportunity to potentially put things right if, if that's not the case. Excellent. So, yeah, so these are the two options. <laughs> so you can either uphold or not uphold uh, the review. So whether they were or weren't reasonable and proportionate, and there is, that is a final decision when we get to that point. The only, there is no further right of appeal. There is a possibility of somebody really wanting to do a judicial review, for example. But when the legislation was created and the guidance created was deliberately so that there was no abuse of the system, which can happen on occasion where a complaint about, for example, the person who's done the review comes to me, a complaint about, um, about me goes to the commissioner, a complaint about the commissioner could come to yourselves. We know that, it, you know, we haven't got rid of that completely. Um, but, you know, and I think genuinely you could still say, even though you wouldn't review that complaint again, if you felt that our processes were wrong or anything else, you could deal with a complaint against, um, against ourselves in relation to that. But actually, that's not part of this process. It's very much this is how it works and, and, and the decision is, is final. So um, we do ask that people get independent legal advice if they are absolutely insistent that um, that they are they are dissatisfied further to the, to this outcome. So on to the next um, process, the next slide. Okay. Where the outcome is not considered reasonable proportionate, um, we can make recommendations then to uh, professional standards for them them to consider so they're not absolutely required to take on board what we say but I have to say it's always been a really reasonable conversation when that's happened um, usually there's learning uh, they, they discuss between <laughs> we mentioned stands and governance officer um, that's the one we have vacancy at the moment and uh, they're just trying to fill um, they discuss that internally first within the OPCC and also discuss them with the professional standards department. Is that a reasonable recommendation? And, and I have to say, when that happens in reality, they, they're all taken on board. You know, we haven't had any concerns and improvements and learning does happen as a result of those recommendations. We have consent to both um, the complainant and to the, and to the standards department. The standards department maintains a motion with any officer involved, so they give those updates to the officer. Then the Standards Department has 28 days to come back to us on um, to respond to that recommendation, any changes they've made, any views that they have, and then we go back to the complainant to say, and this is what's happened as a result. Quite often they may have got um, may have got correspondence from uh, professional standards as well to say, you know, we acknowledge that uh, this review was upheld and this is what we're doing to and this is what we're doing to deal with the matter. Okay, so um, there's just some data on the review findings. Obviously, the state brought in from 2020, uh, and as I said, around about 20 or so that used to go to the heads of PSD in in the first year. You know, they were um, 32. There was um, 
the first request. And um, they, you know, they go in, they go in up every year with that. That's just the uh, the year the year to date. Well, to the end of um, to the end of the calendar year, um, we have twenty six. Um, you'll see that actually um, the vast majority aren't upheld. We do find that what Gwent Police has done, what professional sounds have done, is appropriate, is reasonable and proportionate. But there have been occasions um, where we've said you need to make some changes about your approach. And, and as uh, Holly mentioned earlier, one example I can give was just around um, where somebody's a victim. We've made connect, you know, we make connections between the, the survivor court, the engagement coordinator. Actually, that's something that professional staff is doing as a matter of course now. It's absolutely fundamental to their role and they are ensuring that victims and witnesses are supported through any process. But it's more around the language. The language is all um, applied with the legislation. You know, we just sort of have to bring in sometimes a little bit of a softer approach, I think, depending on who you deal with, dealing with their vulnerabilities and, and what we're trying to handle. So we're still meeting the you know, the legal requirements, but sometimes slightly amending how we do things to make sure um, that it's appropriate for the person on the receiving end as well. But um, there's there just the, the average time taken. Like I said, they're very much um, dependent. There aren't there aren't sort of requirements on us to do things by a certain time. But I think that goes back to the reasonable and proportionate element again. We try and do it. Um, you know, we give the right amount of time if it's a more complex one. Sometimes it takes a little longer. But like I said, so. They're probably just over, they will have received a 28 day update in that period, but probably quite quickly after that will have received their outcome letter as well. So we're working as, as hard as we can to make sure that uh, people are having their updates. And as a rule, you know, I think the system is, you know, it's working very well. Um, but yeah, happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you to both of you for the presentations today. They were really interesting. They've given us a lot of perspective in terms of the processes that go in, into the into dealing with the complaint. It's really helpful to see <clears throat> these are the time scales and there. So I think when complaints have come to the panel previously, with the less case, a lot of the concern has been around the length of time something has taken to be dealt with, and that's not to it's not the complexity of the complaint. That necessarily led to the time scale. It was how it was dealt with and when it was dealt with. So to see those sort of time scales in there, um, that's helpful to know that you know everybody's human. People get busy, but the fact that there's a 28 day, four week time scale in there, you know what's always going to be picked up. And you know if something has happened, it's so much easier then to apologise. Say, I'm really sorry, we're back on this thing. Then we will progress and give them that that feedback. Have you just know the reviews actually were lower? The number that you come through to you as a review is lower than I expected. Um, how does the number of reviews relate to the number of complaints? So how, as a, just as a rough guide, how, compared to the number of complaints you get, how many tend to end up going through for review? Where the complaint chooses to have, ask for review. Yeah, they're significantly lower. And I think we can put that down to the, the detail um, of the report. They're really in-depth documents. They're supported by the legislation mm -hmm. and there's a rationale provided surrounding why we've arrived at the decision that we have. So it's not a simple case of a, you know, a, a letter saying this is the outcome of your complaint. It, they, they really thought out documents. Okay. And so I, I think that that will probably be a, you know, we'll have a direct sort of on it and we'll see. So the individual is much clearer understanding. Exactly. Um, that. And enables them to realise, I understand why we've come to that conclusion. Actually, do I feel the need for the review? Or even is it going to be worth a review given everything that I get to see there? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to add, and I think the, if the team holds me typically, the fact they have throughout the process, they have conversations okay. with, the, with the complainants. So if this, as it's going along, if there are any concerns or if they feel something hasn't been included, and that's one of the, the good bits of feedback we've given back when we've been looking at the review, um, is the fact that that's quite that's audit, auditable mm. as well. Those, you know, it might be a telephone conversation, but they're able to say, but when we spoke to them and actually just clarified this bit, they actually withdrew mm. that part of the complaint. Or, you know, they, there's, there's a really helpful, auditable, transparent trail mm. of that ongoing engagement with the complainant. And I think that's made a world of difference. Yeah. And I, I think, sorry, just part of the key thing is that actually understanding what does the complainant want as the outcome. Uh, exactly. Isn't it? Because we've had complaints come to us, which are three or four pages, but actually 
you don't know what the resolution they want. Sometimes it is just an apology for a situation that individuals been in, and sometimes it is something more tangible and more physical. So, yeah, and and so. and yeah, I, no, Chair, I'll, I, I just to expand on that. I think you're right. I think Sean mentioned and Holly mentioned that the whole ethos of the new regulation was that you know it was complainant centric. What what do you want to happen if somebody just wants their mobile phone back? then get them their mobile phone back quickly, the satisfaction is gone, you know, and, and that's it. Sometimes, you know, there's been a criticism in the past of the police complaints procedure that you get on a train at a station and you can't get off until you get to the end destination, which is rubbish really, because you just want to go where you want to go. So I was just going to come back to one of your points, Chair, because um, I know like me, you're a bit of a stats geek. <laughs> um, so uh, in regards to the actual percentage of, of, um, uh, of complaints that go to reviews, we're currently running at about 16%. On your, so that that's that. The national average is about 24, I believe, at the moment. That's why I went to retrieve my glasses because uh, it's getting a little bit, little bit lower for me now. But but yeah. So the and in regards to the, the stats around this, the IOPC have really up their game. Dare I say it? In the last 18 months to two years, and are looking at those national benchmarking. So that keeps improving and improving. And certainly our plans. And I know um, well, he's not here. My namesake Sam is here. We we've sat, and I think there is a point through next year, I think there's an opportunity for us to share some of that IOPC national data with you once it's the data integrity is right in it. You can see how we're benchmarking against other forces. Uh, and I welcome an opportunity to come back and talk you through that at that time. Excellent. Sorry, I'm just thinking about this. Um, Sam mentioned the IOPC and um, both Holly Keane and Joe Regan in our office have done huge amounts of work about getting this process right, as I said. The IOPC actually are using Gwent as an example of good practice when they're speaking to other um, ports and OPCC arrangements as well. So particularly where we've discussed things and made changes, like I said, the, the spike engagement coordinator element and, and those type of things, they they said that was a that was a level um, beyond what most areas were doing. So they've taken that away. And Joe is speaking to people within the IOPC really regularly to be able to share that. Uh, Good work as well. Thanks, Bos, for the uh, for the presentation. Uh, there was a lot of interesting stuff, but um, it's not completely obvious. There is a limit to how many words you can get on the screen. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the things were completely unreadable for me. I've got it up on, the, on yeah. the, but even on there. There are some slides which are pretty unreadable. So please, uh, I know it's very tempting to get lots of information in, but spread it over a couple of slides if you do. Uh, otherwise, <coughs> why put something on the piece of paper? Yeah. Was the average time for a more serious complaint? Yeah, I mean, and, and that is a real. Um, and this isn't a politician's answer, I promise you, because I'm about as far from a politician as you could get. It's really difficult because, um, you know, we can have some complaints um, that, that will, by their nature, and sometimes the accessibility to the person who's making the complaint as well around illness and everything else can skew those figures slightly. I will put my glasses on and, and flip through. Um, but in regards to, uh, you know, I think, I think my main mantra all the time around timeliness um, is you've got to weigh that up with the proportionality of the investigation and the thoroughness depending on where, where it's at um, from our point of view the uh, the current length of a of a complaint investigation is around about 80 days okay but that is skewed by some real long-term complaints that are there so I know the IOPC themselves are really struggling to get that sort of benchmark around that, and that's perhaps something we can revisit when I when come back next year. I ask because I've got somebody, I won't download every detail. No, of course not. But I've got somebody who's got a serious complaint and he's concerned about the time it's taken. <clears throat> are they updated regularly so that they don't, they don't become concerned about the time it's taken? Uh, process. Yeah, so com the regular complaints every 28 days is, is the is the statutory. We we often exceed that as in as in we do better than that because there's quite often those updates. Um, I'm quite willing to speak to you afterwards if you want around that specific complaint because it may be that it's a, a nautical, but it may be that it's fallen into the misconduct arena, which is not Holly's side and, and a different one altogether. So I can I will speak to you about that. That's okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. 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 Yeah, and, and, and I encourage you to use that because it will go into potential seamers. I explained at the start there's four distinct areas and, and it may be that it's in the misconduct arena that there's vetting issues, but if it comes into that, um, it'll usually drip tray its well way to me and I will find the right person for you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, well, I don't, I don't see the lack of questions, the lack of interest because <laughs> you covered so, you filled in so many gaps for us. As a panel member of the day, and understanding the process, and I think it's particularly key to see the difference between the schedule three and the non schedule three. I think that's clarified for members how they fall, and I think understanding then how they get to review. And I think the reduction in review is, is heartening to see, um, you know, from that point of view. And if that is about the understanding of people, then that, that's the most important thing, isn't it? So, thank you very much for your time today and coming along. Thank you. Okay, is, is it okay if I excuse Holly for the cost to me? Thank you very much. Thank no, you no, no. <laughs> I want it. I want it to go and earn your money. <laughs> I am. Oh, God, I'm going to be a pain now. Oh. I need to so many time about my time. Um, well, the next uh, agenda item is agenda item number seven, which is performance quarter three. Um, so I'll hand over to yourself, Sam. Yeah, direct to yourself, Sam. So, um, you have before you the performance monitoring and tax of quarter three. Um, I want to uh, start my um, the presentation in relation to the performance pack with my thanks to the performance subgroup. I've we'll been working very closely with Sam and um, Peter to make sure that we have um, looked at the format. Um, you know, we've had lots of discussions here about how we um, make sure that we give you uh, comprehensive information, but not overloaded with information. So really wanting to make sure that we distill that information in a in a manageable way. And uh, I want a thanks also to um, the uh, both Lisa's continuous improvement department, who obviously lead on performance um, and work very closely with Sam. And the report that uh, is before you is obviously um, both a reflection of when police is performance, but again, in relation to the role of this panel, it's very much wanting to focus on the, uh, the role and responsibility of the commissioner and his team in providing scrutiny and oversight on performance. And that's done both through the force performance structure, but also through the formal strategy performance board that the commissioner chairs to hold the chief constable and the deputy uh, chief constable to account on performance. <laughs> and very much in terms of how we manage that work, it is a, a supporting challenge role, very much like your own here in terms of looking at our role. So we do very clearly have a, a, a strong uh, oversight on performance, but also on scrutiny and performance, but also we provide that strategic leadership and influence. And throughout our work, and what we've tried to do in this report is to really draw out what the what the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner has done in relation to some of the critical areas of performance. And critically, you know, we are absolutely highlighting the need to um, prioritise violence against women and girls, community safety, victims, anti-racist, uh, the anti-racist and equality work, and also preventing offending and reoffending. And most importantly, our focus is on performance and scrutiny, but it's also on strategic influence, commissioning of services and innovation and how we work absolutely in partnership. So in summary, I, I, I'm, I'm expecting that you will have uh, questions as, as usual, but just to provide a brief overview, it's really good to see in this quarter that performance, uh, that recorded crime has dropped for the first time since quarter three and four in 2020-2021. The reasons for that are likely to be seasonal elements. We also um, uh, anticipate that some of that is around um, the post COVID, uh, uh, you know, as we move post pandemic and post COVID into um, 
returning to a more sort of uh, traditional focus on performance and crime. We know that the chief principal and the deputy chief principal are absolutely focused on uh, crime data integrity. So making sure that we record all crimes is an absolute priority. Um, but we can't be complacent on performance and we are pushing the force to analyse the information and to understand the trends. <laughs> and I'm really pleased that in uh, Rachel's appointment and since Rachel has joined the force, um, her absolute focus has been on performance and in particular the work that she is leading um, very much on the basis of the commissioner and the chief constable's focus is on making sure we have the culture right, we have the standards right, we have the performance right and we deliver for the people of Gwent. So some highlights really that burglary continues to be low compared to the pre-pandemic uh, uh, situation, um, that neighbourhood crime is stable um, and that we have had some success in relation to roads policing. There are challenges. Um, we have um, in our last strategy and performance board um, taken, uh, the, uh, taken the opportunity to talk to uh, the force and the chief constable about homicide levels. We've also focused on the fact that um, in this data pack, we, the levels of uh, rape reporting and outcomes are down. And obviously, whilst we will all have, have the ambition to see rape, uh, rate reporting going down. Actually, in the current climate, we want to make sure, given that we, we know that only 16% of victims report rape, that actually we need to make sure that people who have been um, the victims of sexual assault or rape come forward and report. So our concern is, is real in terms of giving a real spotlight on that. And we're very clear that we have both Re uh, established a rape, uh, dedicated rape team in Gwent Police, but also that we are um, an operation satiric force, making sure that we have an academic and independent rigour in terms of our um, rape analysis and investigation. And most importantly, we are focused on outcomes, and I know that's where your focus comes. So we want to see uh, improved folk, improved outcomes for all victims, and that's where our focus will be, both for the, the deputy chief constable and also myself. In terms of, I know this uh, panel is very um, critically interested um, because of the impact on members in our communities on 999 and 101 performance. And I'm pleased to say that you will see in some of the statistics that we're beginning to see um, a real a more positive outlook in relation to um, 999101. There's clearly work that is being done, but there's more work that needs to be done. And we welcome that the Deputy Chief Council has prioritised this as a key focus. And it's certainly an area that we want to make sure that we have absolutely key, key hopes right on. Um, and in particular, looking at that mix of economy of how people can uh, come forward to report crime, being both um, through force control room by telephone, um, by, by interaction with officers and PCSOs, but also by using social media and the, and the development of our social media on top of And our work on violence against women and girls, which we talked about in the, in the panel update, um, is a real focus for us. Um, one of the things that actually Holly and Sam didn't mention was, you know, we have got a new investment in professional standards of a dedicated post um, to support uh, people who want to make a complaint uh, about police conduct in particular, in, in reflection of the current concerns about police behaviour and conduct. And that is coupled with us um, funding with South Wales OPCC a um, uh, uh, a post and uh, some work based in a third sector organisation um, so that if anybody is concerned about police culture or misconduct, they could contact an independent organisation and uh, and um, provide and they will be supported then to raise their complaint and to bring that complaint forward. Equally, we are, um, and we have discussed previously, I'm leading um, work on violence against women nationally and it's an absolute determined focus for both the Chief Constable and the Commissioner. We do note that public confidence is down to 68% overall, 55% <coughs> for our uh, minority communities. 
he feels about this area that absolutely needs to be a prime focus for us. Um, we want to ensure that, that uh, we have uh, we develop the keys of public confidence. My suggestion at this point is that there is both uh, uh, probably issues around public confidence uh, from web police, but this is also part of a wider national issue around public confidence and policing with people um, recognize and understand you know, the, the current focus. But I'm really pleased, and I can, can assure you, even though she's sitting next to me, she probably <laughs> wants to come in, <laughs> is that the deputy constable is absolutely um, clear that, that she has a robust action plan on performance, that the key priorities are getting the job right, getting the job done, responding for our communities, improving our culture and improving our standards. Um, so with that, really, I, I, I'll, I'll hand over to you for the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we do have some questions for members, but then the members have questions from what they hear and have other students check them through the given. Um, firstly, on page um, 13 and 14 of the pack, um, it's really useful to see a breakdown of the incident, but could we have some members of the point of the intervention that should and how the students stand? We know what the top five types of incidents are in each category. But um, if you're next quarter, we could have some reference, maybe that's something we could work on together. Um, page 40. It also points out overall crime is coming down. But one thing I think we're doing is if you look at um, some of the theories of crime, so all of the theft, commercial burglary, public order, robbery, shoplifting, and theft, those are the three levels of crime. If you compare to quarter three last year, all of those cases, the number has gone up. So in the bottom of those days, it's only quarter three last year. I we were at that point, and I'm guessing we'll likely find that by the end of the year we'll be higher in all of those areas. So whilst the overall crime of quarter three compared to quarter two might have reduced, in those areas we are seeing an increase in trend. So what are the factors contributing to that? And do you think then that the we don't cry we don't buy crime initiative, which was targeted at some of those areas, is having the continued impact that, that we would hope? Absolutely. Um, and, and I think it's really a really important question and it's a really important discussion because I think that there is no single answer, I think. Um, I think the factors will be varied. I think the first is obviously the, the impact of coming out of COVID. So recognising that people will be now uh, you know, more open in society and um, that that will lead to greater uh, potential um, crime um, in particular. But also, I think, um, recognising as well that we are moving into the cost of living crisis. And I think, you know, there has been evidence and there is evidence about um, poverty, disadvantage and crime. Um, and in particular, I think understanding both those two factors in relation to both um, the post pandemic period, but also the issues around the cost of living crisis in particular elements like shoplifting I think is, is really important so it, it may not be that we're we're performing worse but it actually because those crime levels are increasing but unfortunately no, I agree. And if you look at the national trends as well, I think what you find is the number of courses went up much more steeply. Actually, Gwent has gone up on a different parallel uh, sort of line in terms of the increases post COVID. And for us, of course, uh, making sure that we've got data about uh, how we're responding to those crimes is as important to me as seeing the increases in them. So, for me, I think the position that we're in with theft and person robbery, for example, very similar crimes, just depends on the crime reporting standards to which category that falls within. But again, I think the cost of living crisis is something that we all face. Um, again, each quarter will face that slightly differently. Um, I would look for shock and sleep something as carefully around that immediately. And that is something that we're already trying to factor into what we do with our prevention work as well as our local community neighbourhood responses to that. So it's an open difference that we will look at some of them are actually driven here or I think we'll be very concerned on the national level. There are some more local. The one that concerns me and that we're looking into more deeply going to the shop. I think we probably want to just, just in terms of your question should say that we we are still really pleased with the performance of the Reno by Crime Initiative. Um, you know, I think again the, the report recognises the amount of work that has been done on um, you know, bike bikes and making sure that we that people are supported to have their bikes. And, and so that if, if there are is that people stand a much better chance 
of being able to um, recover uh, any soil or property, but also, um, and in particular, this is one that we know my client provides for the work they do in terms of supporting businesses who may have been um, the victims of crime and also the rural crime team. So very much working with the farming community, with the National Farmers Union in relation to making sure that it's really diversified in understanding how crime can impact our communities in different ways. And the, you know, we had a presentation a while ago from We Don't Buy Crime here. And they, said, uh, they, they share with us detailed performance packs every month and, and actually the work of that team we, we should probably be able to bring back and share with them. Um, I was just going to ask in, in relation to the cost of living um, crisis, so we've done some work locally to try and understand the impacts and uh, the Commission also as Chair of Policing in Wales commissioned a report um, which went to both Policing in Wales and the Policing Partnership Board for Wales chaired by the First Minister. Um, so that's, it, it does very much focus on the impacts on crime, but also wider impacts on digital our workforce and, and other things as well. So just to reassure you that we are looking at that and we'll follow it up locally and nationally for the update that we can see here in the future. Councillor Lee Stem, Councillor Mount, and then Councillor Martin Dawson all have questions on the same page. So Councillor Lee Stem. Thank you. Just two questions. One, you mentioned rate statistics of 16 percent the you get a small margin of That's the first question. Second question is, the 20 stroke you look at. Oh, can we, can we sort of work through? Do you mind just on page 14 at the moment? All right, Jane, I, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 so I suppose, those, those are the statistics in terms of the, the percentage of people who, who do report um, incidents of rape. Um, that is an area of national concern, it's an area of local concern. So we are doing absolutely everything we can to make sure that victims who feel more confident and more, that's why the work on public confidence is so important. But more importantly, I would say I'm and Darren and I work on are working on the Wales Sexual Assault Services Transformation Program because actually it's really important that victims report crime. But what's more important is that victims get the support they need. And so our, our we are working absolutely intensively with our colleagues in the NHS to make sure that people can certainly come forward to receive the medical care and treatment that they need and deserve and are supported then to receive the, 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 the police support in terms of reporting crime, but also having their forensic evidence and, and investigation taken forward. But what the most important thing in, for me, yes, we do want more people to report because we do want to bring um, offenders to justice. Absolutely. That's the way we're going to end violence against women is if we actually bring people to justice. But what's most important is the victims of rape get this, that get the help care and support that they require at the earliest possible um, time. So the other 84 percent is either from elsewhere on the hospitals, for example. That, that, um, the specifics on that come from the ONS uh, crime survey. Yeah, for the US, and that's where those sort of assumptions go. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, apologies I couldn't be in this particular uh, um, Subcommittee meeting. Um, unfortunately, it clashed with the approval uh, of the uh, uh, late Senate Commissioner of BCC and BCC and so on. But um, to come back to Tony's question for a minute, I, I want to go on to a couple more. Um, I think you said earlier the way a rape you know, victims are being dealt with is being blocked up and by excuses. It's very worrying. Uh, I've heard a couple of programs on this, and you hear people saying they wish they never bothered because of the experiences they, they've gone through. And regardless of whether the prosecution was um, successful or not, the whole process was treated just so, so bad as far as they were concerned. <laughs> Um, it is waiting when you get that. I know you want to respond before I want to something else. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, quick, so we want, we are absolutely committed to making sure that we provide the best response to those who do come forward and that we can make sure that those who have had a positive experience provide that confidence to other people. <coughs> and that's why we have got our dedicated rate team. That's why we are a member of the Operation Soteria, and that's a very, I mean, policing has all these fancy names, but in essence, that's an external, independent um, process that is absolutely forensically looking at how we discharge our functions in relation to rape. But it's not just looking at the police, it's also looking at the CPS and it's looking at um, the court processes as well. And that's why within the um, Criminal Justice Board, we are looking at end-to-end -end experiences for, for victims right the way through when an incident happens to reporting to making sure they get their support to going through the criminal justice process. And that's an absolute commitment that we've got to doing that. I'm really pleased that when Opsatura came into Gwent, they identified that one of the, the developments that the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner had um, started, which is now based in Gwent Police, is our survivor engagement coordinator. And the survivor engagement coordinator literally looks at every incident of rape and will follow up and make sure that, um, <coughs> that, that we identify good practice and learning that we can. And she directly contacts people to, to learn lessons, and that's a commitment we've got. Okay, thanks, Sergeant. Um, on the possession of weapons, it does seem from the trend this year that um, they are going up, but I assume this is anything wrong. I don't understand to maybe a baseball bat or whatever. But um, it does seem that, that now people are, are either more efficient at detecting weapons or uh, all the other the um, and the other things. So is, is there any work going on? So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the figures, you know, speak for themselves in terms of that. And I think it is probably a mix, I can say, of detection <coughs> and also in terms of um, incidents in particular. Excuse me. So that's why we're committed to doing the work on serious violence. And uh, I'm going to hand over before I start running out of my voice to sound of that serious violence work. Yeah, I, I think um, obviously we touched upon that serious violence duty and this is one of the, the key themes within that duty that we're required to look at and, and over the next year we'll be doing um a needs assessment working in partners to just to to work through these figures why why is that trend going up um you know is it is it just sort of around police dates or are there genuine uh, increases in um, carrying weapons and that sort of thing uh, so so we'll, we'll be doing that work with partners over the course of next year looking at um looking at both possession offenses uh, and and uh, <coughs> that's the point in terms of the cost of living um, uh, elements. Clearly, inquisitive crime, thefts, etc., are, are likely to rise during um, sort of economic downturns. But also, violent offences have a tendency to rise as well. Again, it's one of those things that we're very cognizant of when we have to this power, just to make sure that we, on the back of it, have the right approaches, uh, both for the but also for the function concerns. Would it be correct to assume that um, this is still going on to conventional schools and have to find those who have it? Absolutely, and um, we were really proud last um, last November to house uh, to host the Knife Angel, um, yeah. and through our work with Fearless, you know that's a constant message in terms of raising awareness with young people about the dangers of knife crime and, and and violence. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think you know four strands to this prevent pr protect prepare pursue i think what we've got to look at is all the different avenues that are available to us and the tools within the toolkits there to try and prevent people from carrying weapons in the first place by the time they're already subject to a stop search and those weapons have been identified and seized by police it's you know automatically it's too late isn't it that something could have happened so our, our very much our, our, our work with serious violence duty with other forces nationally with parks nationally we were trying to prevent that in the first place rather than get to the position of having to very very sadly do Okay, Joe Hart. Uh, Sam has already mentioned shoplifting, so no point in that. Okay. Did you have a question on that? Yeah, I, I, I did have, but it's been answered. Well, it's been answered, but I'd also like to ask about 
one place, unfortunately, a more joined up service where if somebody comes in for shoplifting and it's found that they have issues with the cost of living crisis, uh, do they are you able to refer them to, uh, to help to to solve their fears problems? Yeah, and I think I think that's that at the very heart of our diversion services is about that process. So it's about when people come into contact with the police that we have services and an approach that recognises the whole host of reasons why people may. Um, have, have have you know um, um, stolen something, and actually taking a holistic view. It may be around housing, mental health. It may be around substance misuse. So both our future law service um, and the GDAS work um, very much looks at um, making sure we connect with the person, we understand, and we can take and we can take um, uh, action in terms of that element of work. Don't know, Sam, if you want to say anything about how to what disposals as well. Well, I, I suppose it, it, there is a, a whole suite of tools um, that officers have got at their disposal in terms of dealing with that specific incident. And, and, and one of the things is um, how to court disposals, community resolutions working up that agreement between the, the, the victim and the offender um, that doesn't necessarily require a more punitive route. Uh, and, and so I think, although a lot of these are up, up for review through the UK government, um, you know, having all of those tools available means that hopefully the officers can make judgment calls that, that's in the best interest of all parties. Thank you. We'll go to page 15, Councillor Clarkson. Oh. Give me a second. Technology always likes to go blank. Just run in front of me from it. Okay, I was sort of looking at um, the um, outcome rates for all crimes, and particularly around sort of um, 15 to 17, 18, where they, they seem to be um, high dropout rates, and specifically around 0.6 with victims withdraw support. And there's a main suspect identified. Um, just wondering, once ha have we got an idea of what the barriers are? Why people are actually withdrawing as the victims sort of testimony? Um, as that investigated further, once we have identified them, what measures are being taken to reduce the incidence of victim withdrawal? Um, and I hear about things like pre-recorded evidence coming into use and um, prioritisation of vulnerable or victimised um, victims. So I was just wondering what was happening with the Gwent Police around that, um, because it seems that the victim satisfaction figures do not mirror the high, relatively high year-on-year -year withdrawal rates within those areas. Um, and I, I welcome the fact that um, this page 26 refers to um, timeliness of police investigations and that type of thing. And can see from the rest of the conversations there is things going on, but that does seem like a specific area of concern where we could focus and make some improvements. It is, I mean, it is. Yeah, again, I should give you my choice. It is an absolute focus with my police and for ourselves, but it is <laughs> an issue that is, you know, that is uh, within Gwent Police. This is a national issue, but it's one that we work on very consistently and the, the deputy chief constable through her performance board really focuses on and holds people to account to actually understand. I'm really pleased that in when we've done work with the CPS on what we call attrition rates. <laughs> so actually understanding why victims withdraw from criminal processes and, and, and really understanding that and other parts of Wales are doing now the same piece of work that we've done here in Gwent with the CPS on understanding attrition rates. But uh, uh, alongside that, it's, it's a whole suite. So making sure we've got our, our, our response right so that victims that from the very first point of contact confident and are kept updated is a critical area. So again, the Deputy Chief Constable will talk a lot about making sure that we are victim centric and that officers understand their responsibilities on keeping victims up to date. But we also have both independent um, sexual violence advocates 
uh, independent domestic uh, violence advocates, all of whom are um, outside of the police and they support victims. And so we support, we fund and support an organisation called New Pathways to provide support to sexual, um, to uh, victims of sexual assault and sexual violence. And we fund a, a range of organisations um, who provide that for, for victims of domestic abuse. And through when we were talking about the contract management earlier and how we, so we are always, and Sam and uh, Emma Lionel from our office in contract management will always be pushing those services to say, what, how do we make sure that we do um, engage more and more victims and that we do try and prevent victims from falling out of the out of the system? I think you know Councillor Mann's question points out <laughs> the, the nature of the criminal justice system. Um, you know those are things that really test us, and and one of the aspects that I know in the Operation Satira debrief. Um, colleagues were saying, well, you know, the criminal justice system is 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 challenging for victims, and therefore, you know, maybe it is in victims' best interest to go through the criminal justice system. And I challenge back on that because I absolutely think we need to achieve justice for victims, and we also need to make sure that perpetrators are held to account, and 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 that then we have an opportunity to challenge that behaviour. And so I think it is incumbent on all of us in the criminal justice system to make the system better, to make the system work for victims, and critically to that is about the voice of survivors. So making sure that victims can tell us what it is, how it feels like to be part of us, to go through our systems and services, and that, you know, right away from professional standards, that that feedback influences how we deliver our services. Do you want to come in at this point? Okay, yes. So, uh, so I think it's, it's a whole system of things that, that we need to do better, differently, analyse, understand, and also interpret. So to look at a linear number like that is, is worrying, and you're right to flag it, absolutely. One of the things I've been absolutely cr crystal clear on since arrival at Forces, we need to understand our data better. We need to understand how our data aligns with the next set of data and how the processes work. Because we don't need to put a sticking plaster on something by just analysing why is it in the last month, for example, we saw attrition rates. This is a this is a system of the way that we operate. So, for example, some of the tensions that we've got at the moment is I want people, the first point of contact, to understand that their job is to deliver everyday excellence to the people who phone us, to make sure that everything that they, they say to us is recorded, we assess the vulnerability, we look for the levels of harm within there. Now, some of the metrics we've got is when people phone 101, for example, or 999 to report a call is we need them to be answered in a certain amount of time and the length of that call should then lead to someone being dispatched. Put better processes in the front end of that to make sure we listen to our victims really, really well. I slow that process down, but is that better for victims? Is that right? Is that the right thing for us to be doing to get the best information? There's a tension that needs to be there uh, and we need to understand that well. The next set is once you've had the initial call, is then somebody responds to that call. Are we sending the right person with the right skills to be with that individual at that at that position? Because that's the first exposure they necessarily will have to an officer, and how the, how that interaction goes will potentially set up how they then feel about the investigation through throughout the entire system. I'm not going to go through the whole lot. You're going to be glad to know. What I'm suggesting is that none of these things can be done in isolation. The answer to the very astute question you've asked is really complicated, and it goes from everything from our professionalism and our standards to our culture and our communication. And all of those things have to be right, along with the way that we deal with both the victim and the offender throughout that process. And of course, the way that we do that with our partners as well, diversion schemes, early intervention, out of court disposals, because they are right in some circumstances, but also that handover, handoff piece. People who phone the police expect the police to see the prosecution through from one end to the other. The fact that other agencies are involved, such as CPS, is not necessarily known. In the outside in. So actually a lot of a lot of the reporting on trust and confidence is seen as a policing issue when it's a much wider criminal justice system issue. So we have to work really well with our partners along that that framework as well to make sure that's right. So in answer to your question, we do understand it and we absolutely hold people to account for it. My job is to make sure every part of that system is looked at and I'm going to tell you to do the chief contributing for having everyday excellence through all that we do. And that's what I'm driving for to the performance improvement boards that we've got in forces. Apologies, panel, but I understand the Deputy Chief Council has to leave us. So I just, before leaving us, I just without checking if there was anything you wanted to direct specifically at the DCC. 
I don't think so, but if it does come out in the meeting, um, if you'd be happy for Mr. Parson to do a piece we see uh, for yourself and you can respond to just the site superset things off to try and see if you can. Thank you so much. And I apologize for the Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to attend today. Much appreciated. Just want to come back on that. So, so looking at what you've just said, this this figure and how it changes could be the objectivity of the overall efficiencies of an entire range of service improvements that you've explained and worked on. So, so this this figure could be a really key area and maybe something to focus on. And it could also be the public confidence. <coughs> so things are improving, you know, this figure is going down, people are more likely to stick. So it seems really important to me that, that this is sort of highlighted more. I think um, you're absolutely right. It, this is a, a really clear focus for us as an office in terms of our scrutiny report. I, I think there is um, positive signs. And I think we're on track this year to be the lowest of low down when I'm in Gimli 16 for a good five years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, something is obviously working and it's starting to start to see those improvements. I think that's probably a big shout out to the victim care unit yeah. and yeah. the work that they do um, in terms of that, that more in-depth engagement with victims and, and they've got us quite a good service recovery process in place. <coughs> me. So that when they're having uh, conversations with victims and there's a, you know, they're getting a sense that they might want to withdraw, then they can do that to have that conversation with the investigating officers or, or whoever's got control of that and, and, and recover that um, uh, recover that service so those conversations can take place. So I think it's really worth emphasizing here the work of that Flint and Canadian does to um, to, to support it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think we are on a page at the same time. Um, Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, on the left hand side chart on 15 and there is, um, well, the uh, the outcomes are not exactly wonderful, are they? Um, for most things, it's important. But uh, there's one that stands out probably even more as well, it's, it's a flawed one. Now, I've got a feeling that fraud is dealt with elsewhere. Is, is that the reason they're all on zero? Sipping yes. London or something? Absolutely. So the, the, it, it is reported that it, that's probably an error in, in that we should have brought that out in the narrative in the report. It is a good that for future reports. But it is it is managed differently in terms of how crimes are recorded and reported. Obviously, when police have done a significant amount of fraud, uh, working very closely with the City of London, which is the lead force for all of the forces, and it is an area of, of um, a real focus. So just to give you assurance that that, that there is positive there is positive outcomes fraud, but it's not recorded in the same way. But obviously fraud is an area that I know is of interest to this panel and one that we will need to make sure that we keep a, a very close appraisal of in terms of performance. I think a lot of that is cyber crime, which is very serious for the individual that seems to escape My intention is um in the next report is that we'll have a more in-depth focus on the cyber. And just one on the right hand sort of chart. Uh, number seven. Um, and maybe I missed it, but uh, on cannabis warming, uh, has there been some, some sort of a policy change on that? Yeah, so, so, so uh, it happens. <laughs> yeah, so the cannabis warnings you've seen, the penalty has sort of taken out gone um, in terms of um, the, the legislation. That's all kind of been roped and brought in together with community resolution, et cetera. Uh, so, yeah, so that, that, that one is probably an error. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they've gone. That's why it's easier this man in lots of places. What's that, sorry? That's why it's easier to detect in lots of places than it used to be. Well, it's, it's still dealt with. It's just dealt with in terms of a positive outcome statistically. I mean, the, the use of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, page 16. So, as you've already commented, 99101, that was more of interest to the panel. So, it's interesting that obviously the 999 calls are increasing, um, particularly over the last quarter. So, you know, that could possibly explain the, the dip in terms of nine million programs in 10 seconds. But those one-on-one -on -one calls, particularly since 
44 of 21-22 have gone sort of an average response time of five minutes. That's now we virtually double it of nine minutes and forty. And what actions are being taken by the uh, commissioner to ensure that there's improvements in those in those areas? So nine like, well, one one in particular is an area of constant um, discussion between the commissioner and the chief constable. Um, and we are aware that you know with with the control room coming now moved um, into the new headquarters building that we, we have a renewed focus on making sure we understand um, the performance around 101. So it's certainly an area that we will be getting dedicated um, attention as time to. Um, the next question I've got recorded on page 32. Has anybody got any questions on what page you have to do? Ask about the one on one figures. How much page? I mean, 16. 16. 16. Okay. Um, why do you think the um, one on one figures have got worse than the response? Well, I think it's a. I think actually what the, the deputy chief constable said before she left, so I think there there is an absolute focus on making sure we respond, but that we respond in a in a in the appropriate manner. So it, it's not that answering the call in, in a most timely manner is really important, but actually spending time with people is equally important. It's that balance that she was talking about around not just trying to you know, have a quick conversation but where we absolutely need to do more in-depth work um, and in particular make sure that we understand what the victims needs when they are coming through so we are absolutely increasing our focus on our victims assessments at that first point of contact which then takes time and has a knock on effect and we're wanting to make sure that it, 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 it is that and not that it's inefficiency in the housing we're bringing 999 instead of 101 because they're frustrated with the times of waiting for the calls. I don't think that's it. That's certainly not the feedback we've, we've had. I think it, that it is genuinely the volume of calls that come into 999. It's significant. Um, and, you know, all of the, the technology so, so, solutions that we're putting in and wrapping around the control room is about making sure that we get the right people to the right point of where they need to be um, connecting with us as a service. I'm going to ask, would they ever consider, like, if you bring 101 and have a, a, an options, so that option one is a certain complaint or option two, okay. could, have they ever considered that? I think we have that, an option that's, system. That's in place. Oh, yeah. there is an option system. There is an option system so that, so that people can be directed through to where they need to be, um, but also reckon, remembering that you also have got you know, the development of our social media um, uh, uh, offer as well, so that people can come through um, through other mechanisms as well. I was just going to add to the focus as well on getting the resource into the control room. So um, it may be seen as a positive in some respects, but a lot of people who've come in as control room operators have been successful in becoming um, community support officers and police officers within Gwent Police. So there's a real um, backfill process going on. The, the recruitment is constant now into the control room because how successful those people have been working in the team have been in getting other um, frontline roles within within policing. So it is an absolute focus um, and trying to manage that, but it is something that uh, the recruitment is required. <laughs> it's the doorway in. Uh, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Councillor Hussain, then Councillor Clear on these, this particular page, was it? Uh, no, it was actually yeah. about, um, it's actually probably to do with the antisocial behaviour. Um, I mean, you've all probably seen in the media now with the like, oxide removal uh, going to be banned. Um, and these figures, uh, uh, and nitrous oxide and cane laughing gas, is that um, there's a lot of you know, antisocial behaviour because of that. And these figures are without any, um, without, without it being banned at the moment. What I wanted to know, I mean, are you um, thinking of ways how to tackle that? And will the, the figures then be changed? And at the moment, are there, um, do you have much, you know, crime to do with laughing gas or, you know, the nitrous oxide being recorded? Have you got anything like that at all? I'm going to pass over to Sam in relation to the specifics on that, but I think in terms of antisocial behaviour, absolutely a key focus um, for the Commissioner, both in terms of 
community safety and social behaviour um, and making sure, you know, there were announcements this week by the UK government around developments of, 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 on how um, we should be managing anti-social behaviour and it's something that we're absolutely committed to doing. But Sam, I don't know if you want to say Yeah, that. just, um, and again, not, not my area of expertise, but certainly around that anti-social behaviour, the, the subcategories beneath that are, are quite wide, so it's quite difficult to, to hone in because that, that, that sort of um, quality of life crime and, and antisocial behaviour is it's, it's different for everyone, but certainly around that nitrous oxide, I'm, I'm sure what will happen now, what the, the national government is looking to give in is that sort of understanding of the problem profile that we've got. Um, there's not a specific subcategory that we record specific drugs, and certainly with nitrous oxide at the moment, because it isn't illegal, because it, it, it isn't. Um, but that understanding that problem profile, they'll probably look to do a, what we call a free tech search within our record management system to understand how much that antisocial behaviour can be linked to nitrous oxide. Gives us a starter for 10 then when we, when if it is, passes through and it does become illegal, something that we have to uh, police. Just, just to add to that, just in terms of the government's um, uh, new antisocial behaviour plan and obviously this approach that there is funding that will be coming on the back of that into police and crime commissioners to work with partners, as, as the commissioners highlighted in terms of the community safety space and working with local authorities in particular, who've got uh, as equal a, a, a task as the police in terms of the response. Um, and you know, we're, wait, we're waiting for detail on that, on that, on that funding and how we can use it for that. We're paying for increased visible policing, increased community wardens. From, in other agencies and, and, and increasing that presence to be able to hopefully tackle some of this stuff so that we the figures don't necessarily go up. One of the other things that um, we've talked about is simulation. We've talked about the cost of living um, issues previously, and I think that, that, that there's a correlation again with antisocial behaviour, but also I would just flag, I think, for colleagues. Um, for, you know, in terms of local authorities, one of my real concerns, as we all know, it's not just policing who are facing really difficult financial times, but our local authority partners as well. And what really worries me in particular is our youth provision and making sure that when, when councils are facing really difficult financial challenges and, and decisions, that we remember that the, the really vital role that youth services um, provide um, in terms of the in terms of supporting young people to be positive in their communities rather than you know ending uh, contributing to more challenging antisocial behaviour. Okay. Just a couple of follow-ups. First of all, I got some other questions with with regards to um, the laughing gas thing. Um, hear what you say about stats etc uh, opposition parties have ridiculed it as being a not a priority is there a perception at all that it is an issue first of all I, I, I think that's a really difficult one for me to answer in my current role because I, I'm, I'm not engaged within that sort of neighborhood issue anecdotally it's it's something that, that it's been seen within within some you know some part of the community and linked to antisocial behavior but then those little canisters are also accompanied by, dare I say, bottles of Stella and other matters, you know. So is it is that specifically an antisocial behaviour drug? I would say no. I think it's just part of the of that current scene at the moment. So but there is, as you rightly say, that there is that we need to understand the problem, don't we? And I think I think if nothing else, the debate that's happening now will, will allow us to start try and understand that. Well, it's interesting that there has been almost a, a solution put into place, yet we seem to be saying uh, that, that this may be nationally. We don't know if there is a problem. <laughs> yeah, and and again, we, we sort of veer into the political space yeah. slightly there, don't we, Joe? <laughs> Certainly, I won't go there. <laughs> yeah. um, the second follow-up was related to the 101 calls, if I may. Um, as rightly pointed out, there's been a significant change in that answering times. And it, what I heard, it almost seems to be a significant change in policy as well in what's happening on that front line um, in the sense that uh, calls are the first point of contact was what you referred to etc is this suggesting therefore that um, potentially there will need to be more staffing on these 101 calls if the if the response times is going up 
because more time is being spent quite rightly. So it's a, it's a, it's a great point that's been raised as the first point of contact. Suggest that we're going to need more one on one staff to get these numbers back down to, you know, that the, when you look, when you compare the numbers at the beginning of that uh, uh, trend analysis, it's quite a significant change. I think we're absolutely making sure that the first point of contact has the level of resources it requires, I think is, is a key priority. I think there is an element of resourcing, um, but there is also, as Sean mentioned, the issue around staff capacity and yeah. turnover. So I think it's a mix of making sure we have got the right cohort and establishment at the same time um, that we, you know, that we we make ourselves, we've got the technology to be as effective as we can. Um, so, you know, with moving into the new HQ, that's provided us with a real opportunity. So I think it's multifaceted, um, but actually that has to be one of our focuses. The, the, the absolute critical focus is making sure that our 999 is absolutely um, a priority. Um, but I absolutely wanted to make sure that people do have uh, an adequate response to one on one is important as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. I just want to say, is, is there the opportunity maybe for new members to attend uh, the new office and see the new control room so, yeah. so that visibly, you know, they, they have an understanding of, of what what the control room is and how it deals with things. Certainly, Chair, I mean, that's very remiss of us to have not offered that. I think, you know, there's the, op the opportunity of coming to see the new HQ and in particular to see the, the enforced control room, I think is really important because for those of you who saw the old control room, it bears no resemblance. So, I, yeah. I, you know, I look for, and I know the Chief is incredibly mm -hmm. proud. Um, you know, I know in all of the building work and the preparation for the new HQ building, the area that had the most significant mm -hmm. Um, attention was the control room um, and you know making sure that that our uh, control room operators are in the absolute best environment they can be and I think it's fair to say it is you know I think all the feedback is really really positive so um, it's remiss of us you have not an intention to two specific questions one relates to the diversity within the force. Those numbers are quite stark in there. So um, I wanted to ask what actions are being undertaken with regards to dealing with diversity, what plans, and is there a drive to improve? I don't know if you want to take that question first, Chair, and I've got a second question. Do you want to take that question take first? Take question first, is that yeah. So there is absolutely a commitment and focus on diversity increasing up to the workforce, um, both through the operation uplift that uh, there's a national drive to say, you know, we need to not only do we need to make sure we, we meet our obligations to the numbers um, that we have to in terms of the numbers of new police officers through Operation Uplift, but also in terms of that diversity. So from a National Police Chiefs Council, there is an absolute focus and there's dashboards of data where each force is looked at in detail about their performance of um, diversity. I think the second thing to say is that we have a lot of positive action on officers um, in terms of um, uh, web police where um, we are actively wanting to go out and promote police officer recruitment, CSO recruitment in our communities and support people who want to apply to web police and helping them uh, provide, you know, helping them with their application process, helping prepare them for um, interviews and and uh, in particular, but but it doesn't stop there. And I think that's the real issue. So one of the things that I and the commissioner spend a lot of time saying is what about retention? Yeah. Because it's it's not good enough just to get people in through the door and actually understanding the culture that they come into and that they want to stay within web police is really important. So that is almost, you know, a, a, and certainly uh, we've got staff networks who will, um, you know, uh, who will um, specifically want to support people who are employed by either as police officers or staff um, to make sure that their working environment and their their experience of being employed by both places is, is, is really important. And that looks at both um, the, the the, their, their experience as an employee, but also issues around progression 
and um, and uh, making sure that, it, that as you know that, that, that people are disadvantaged through the rank system and, and through learning and development opportunities and also in different parts of the organization so a lot of, of work and attention on, on diversity does anybody else have a question on that particular point? Two more questions. Okay, but, but that, in many respects, sort of leads on to my final point, which is relating to the health and well-being for uh, officers, um, and the, which is on page 26, which is the final okay. page, um, the increasing trend that's seeing there with regards to sickness absence, um, and whether or not the long term sickness absence uh, staff uh, is, is a is it continuing to arise? What's the causes of that? And what are the, the force? Is it leading to officers leaving the force? Um, and if so, what priorities, what attention is is the force giving this particular area, noting the trend that's going back up? The Commissioner is really concerned about the sickness levels and again it's an area of um, constant discussion between the Commissioner and the Chief. The Chief as we have known previously, you know, is absolutely focused on the well-being of officers and staff um, and understanding this area and making sure that we provide that, you know, whether it be through line managers, supervisors or through our occupational health care service in terms of making sure that people um, are, are looked after. So it's an area of concern for us and it's an area we continue to look at and we shall have a territory <laughs> board where that's looked at in, in more detail. But I think it's a mix probably again of um, the measures and the demands of people in terms of people's um, you know people's experience of, of, of just doing sort of <laughs> demanding job. Um, I think also the issues around um, you know, cost of living and stress for, for families, you know, that, that also impacts on, on police officers. But in particular, making sure that we have got our well-being support um, is, is uh, being provided to um, officers and staff is really important. So um, it's an area that we will keep under review. We're also going to be thinking on the need to die attended in force, starting to see a reduction in the levels of long term sickness due to the really focused work that's been going on since the last <clears throat> the last quarter. And it's exactly as Elaine said, a lot of it is stress outside of work. And there's a you know a wellbeing team that's now established. There's a lot of work being done. Um the Oscar Kilo work that um that uh, the Chief Constable commissioned to, to make sure that our occupational health and wellbeing structure was was correct as well. So um, you know, there, there's been a real focus on it, and it is starting to improve. It sounds not in sweat. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 sure. I, I, I just think it's again, as always, that the devil's in the detail, isn't it? Because obviously the, the the graph itself is skewed somewhat in the in the. COVID-19 was not classified as sickness previously, and now is so under that. So you get that steep rise. But Councillor, you're really right to point out those long-term sickness absence, absence reasons because they are concerning because they, they do automatically lead you down the line of, well, that is the, that's the stresses of the jobs. And some of them are, albeit, um, and there is a crossover sometimes into my world in professional standards, that sometimes those stresses are not particularly job related. They can be external. What, what I can say is some of the preventative work that's being done um, when officers are attending really difficult and traumatic scenes there and then, actually before this actually comes in it's, a, it's a, known as a trim process but effectively it's a deconfliction for them in order to to sort of speak and, and have that access then and also signposted outside of the police well-being into other areas for counseling etc should they come that which then we're hoping will limit the ptsd anxiety stress depression further on down the line so that that sort of preventative stuff is key as well council so, so would you have, for example, any of the staff who might be, as it's just officers, as it were, uh, you know, qualified uh, for health first aiders? Is that something that? Uh, yeah. So the the the, the uh, as I said I'm, I'm using an acronym that I'm not or an initialism. I'm not going to be able to to tell you what trim stands for because it's just something that we do in the police. But there are what's known as trim practitioners within the police, so they they will identify those individuals. Do the initial scoping and then signpost them in. The, 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 the mental health first aiders of yeah. our uh, you know, workforce who, so rather than a formal process, yeah. actually 
because they're working with colleagues, they might trigger something actually can you know, they have a chat and yeah and, and, and they're able to identify are you aware of the processes within the police uh, yeah. setup, whether it's a, a web page whether it's the uh, health officers or whether the, the trim process etc yeah. is that in place yeah. 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 I think you know certainly in my time with Mervis, I think you know the effort the effort to focus on mental health and, me and well and mental well-being of officers and staff has, you know, really been a significant focus. You know, even when I, you know, first started um, as deputy police and fire commissioner, I think there was a, you know, a, a, you know, police officers absolutely are focused on doing the job mm -hmm. and getting the job done and moving on to the next job, and sometimes at the detriment of recognising yeah. the impact on their emotional and mental health. And I think that is why um, chief constables are crossing the Wales and commissioners have absolutely focused on the mental health and well-being of officers and Oscar Kilo is a particular example of bringing in that expertise so we, we might not call them mental health first neighbors we probably call them something different in terms of but actually that focus on recognizing that support um, from, from an emotional well-being perspective is is, is, is absolutely understood and, and provided but I think you're absolutely right to bring in outside home matters yeah. because you said it can yeah. those stresses and strains can affect the performance of, of, of the job so absolutely I get the PTSD scenario yeah. you know some of the work the officers have to deal with is, is quite horrific and, and it's you know it's great to hear the focus that's on there but noting the trends as you've said but also great to hear that you're focused in on that as well so thank you very much Thank, thank you for that safety net, John. You can remember what it means. Thank you. channels are accessible to young people but I'm confident that we do more than that we actually create opportunities to engage directly with young people and some of you may have seen that in the last month um, we've had a, a youth question time where over more than 100 young people came to grill the chief constable <laughs> and, and the commissioner and uh, the children's commissioner as well and uh, you know sitting here sometimes it you know it feels that the, the questioning is really intense but I tell you what being in front of those young people there was nothing more intensive and that's why I suppose we build those relationships with youth organizations as well so that we can make sure that organizations that that where young people feel comfortable supported and connected to um, they 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 can be the first point of contact for them and that we've got a really close relationship with them so whether that's the um you know make the national information line or whether it's local projects such as Cabran Centre for Young People or St Genneth uh, Centre for Young People or some of the youth organisations in each of the local authorities that we really build that connectivity and Brian and Rod's team has a real relationship with all the participating officers in the local authorities that we're continuously listening, hearing 
finding out about the other group members being gay and queer. It's like in terms of the specifics on social media, there are. Uh, I'll do as quickly as I can. Um, I, I think there's, there's two points, obviously, and Amy's touched on a lot of it. Uh, we sent through that um, an update of all the work that we've done around child centre policing uh, to panel members prior to this uh, meeting that just highlights the, the, the lens that we go to to try and ensure that we are uh, engaging with children and young people on issues that matter to them. These questions line is, 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 is a good example. But we do things like um, safe space workshops with going into schools and working with uh, children and young people on the things that matter to them and what they're concerned about. Uh, and then going back and, and feeding back to them, well, actually, you raised this and we've worked with the, we work with the family very closely on a lot of this with the neighbourhood team that this is, um, you know, this is your reassurance or this is what we've done. Um, Specifically around the social media, so I'm happy to, to talk at length, probably wait for this meeting if you want, run through all the different levels of, of, of things that we do. Um, specifically around the social media, you know, we do use, we, we do use um, the say, standard kind of um, social media channels, but we're actually doing a piece of work at the moment, um, uh, working with children and young people on the type of content that they want us to use, the channels that they want us to use. And it's, you know, you're not going to be surprised that it wasn't, it wasn't to work with Facebook. Um, and we're actually doing work with them. I'll give you an example. We went to um, Pepper Vale, uh, uh, the colleague went uh, well-being that uh, uh, the children and young people wanted the information about sexting, um, about, you know, it, it, you know, they were um, exploited, you know, uh, uh, safeguarding. So we actually worked with them on that material. And then when we were there, we were talking to them about it and providing information to children and young people. And another example where, where we were creating content specifically that children and young people wanted is what we did, we did with my mates, um, a, a disability group um, local about making hate crime um, um, information easy to understand and in the form that they wanted. Um, so, so we're doing that a lot and we're, we're hoping to, to roll out this year um, and frankly a huge program um, with, with children and young people, including a, a, an advisory board working with children and young people with lived experience of the criminal justice system. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> and um, let's say if you want if you, if you want to have a conversation or I can walk you through um, um, all the different aspects away from young people that happen to do it. One, one final question on, on the agenda item for the day, Bennett, and that's just a, a request again for the kind of information sheet you put together on the National Card and Police and Measures. Um, it's something we've touched upon. Um, but I've just had a brief look based on where we are in quarter three. The six police in National Crime and Police and Measures. One of them is reduced neighbourhood crime, which is something we appear to be increasing in at the moment, again, as may other other causes. Cyber, cyber crime, again, that's something we've got a complete gap, gap work at the moment in terms of reporting to the panel and improved satisfaction of victims. So again, out of the three, out of the six measures, three, we are sort of two increase, two, the performance is not as well. Um, one, we've got a gap on, um, Murder and other homicides being one of the crimes will obviously have a significant increase. It's not a big issue for Gwent, and guess any significant change does the skew those figures. But the content of the is serious problem for the supply. Um, the content and how you report them obviously needs to be in line with other authority, other forces. So it would be helpful if when we look at quarter four, we could see that picture for the for the measures uh, overall. But thank you very much for your Okay, one, one quick last question then, and then we'll wrap up this agenda. So, this might have been dealt with already. It's, um, I could, is it Matt Williams in charge of the patrol room? Oh. Carl Williams, thanks. Oh, okay, they keep changing. Uh, anyway, I had a couple of instances where local residents have not been given reference numbers when they've called in and that sort of thing. So, maybe, I don't know, regular reminders, I don't know, might be given to. Uh, to, to staff that they should be giving out a reference number um, when, when people do manage to get them. Uh, but um, uh, the other one is on uh, it's large, large page 19 or small night. Um, it's about the um, the fatal five offences, uh, the driving offences on road safety. 
And uh, one of those is drink dry, uh, drink dry, dry uh, surprisingly. Uh, we had a horrendous incident in, in a couple of weeks ago where the van driver was molested from the van driving. Is there any routine testing for drug driving? Because um, some people would claim that it's a big problem now, but yeah, it's a good question. Well, I mean, again, I would hand over to um, operational colleagues in terms of the specifics. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, the um, the concern around drink driving and drug driving is 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 considerable. That's why the commissioner um, has you know joined forces with people like Go Safe to run campaigns. Um, certainly, running up to Christmas um, to make sure that the you know, acceptability of drink driving and drug driving is is widely known. Um, and certainly, you know, when police take their this this um, area very very seriously. Yeah, and, and certainly, um, certainly from my point of view, and again, um, we, keep, we keep going further and further from my area of expertise and traffic, but anyone in the room that will know me is well away from my area of expertise. However, what I can tell you is that, um, as we know, in my, certainly in my 23 years of policing, that approach to driving offences and drink drug driving has now changed in the fact that actually now it is considered equal. So our traffic officers and our officers, when they stop and have cause to stop cars, have the opportunity to test for drugs as well as, as drink. And that is well within their conscience, because as you've rightly said, you know, that is that is certainly um, one of the, the main factors around the fatal five that's been talked around there. So um, a tragic incident, as you as you pointed out. Terrible brawl. But that would have been at the forefront of the traffic investigator's mind on arriving at that scene. Exactly. Just on the, the matter of um, uh, reference numbers, I know that the Deputy Chief Constable in particular is very focused on making sure that members of the public are given the information that they require, and that was that is an area that she scrutinises very, very critically. So um, I can give you that assurance, Councillor Mann. So, so somebody complains, we've realised it has been given. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you to Sam and his team, particularly for the work in putting this together. Um, and, and thank you for engaging with the, with the circle of which you do. And, and thank you to the other the Sam in the room for stepping in and uh, providing those responses. Uh, moving on then to agenda item eight. Can you uh, make our part of Thank you, Chair. Uh, just for members to note, as has been referenced earlier in the meeting, um, this report seeks to formally join the finance and estates group um, because of the, the relationship in terms of the, the, the impact on the budget um, with the state strategy, particularly on the on the proposals in in um, Brown, and it's been suggested that we formally um, merge these two groups, and then we have it we established a series of meetings that are run alongside our panel meetings we have held two weeks prior, um, just so that the members of the group can be formally um, briefed and to be kept in touch more, on a more regular basis. So we have probably five meetings a year, plus this additional one that was talked about earlier, that was to um, And just to see if members are happy to, to move that recommendation and we'll formally move to the group. Let's move it, yeah, oh, second. second. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you, members. Can I, can I just come in briefly on that? It's um, to run the finance training session for panel members. That's all panel members, so not just. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah. The just wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah. We'll leak it. Well, I was discussing. I'll be first. I'll be first. Some of the action points in January. We felt it would be helpful if we varied them. We've got practice. We have lovely slides. It's a great show. Moving on to debt right to nine. Uh, yeah, this is work programme. Um, obviously, the next meeting for members is June. Um, I would like to suggest that um, I can give some apologies for the 30th of June. I was wondering if members would be happy to move to the week earlier on the 23rd. Um, it's not a problem if you can't, because we can still hold on to but bear in mind we'll have some apologies. So, I'd be happy to have it on the 23rd, which is Friday, the week before. June yeah, or May? 23rd of June. Right, it'll be the week before that's planned then. Doesn't bother me yet. We, we, we've got to go through an annual 
committee process, so I'd like him to hope that he's still on this committee, but who knows? We all got to go through the yeah. yeah. Okay, then what I'll do is amend the work program, then we'll formally um, you, set out the date. Could you circulate the date? And yeah, get the sure. and if we send out a hold-in meeting um, request, so we won't be, a, we won't be too interested, but we'll yeah. send out a meeting request. We'll go into your yeah. residence. All right, thank you. <laughs> It's just the rules because um, I mean, lots of people say you know, there's an umpteen accident from there. Uh, if there have been umpteen accidents in the first few years, they understand what we've got. So, yeah, I don't understand. It's probably not that aside. So, the there isn't very much place for your ongoing injury, stroke, cough, accidents. So, I think that there was like before the cold week, the end of the day, the council chat of the to make sure that there was information for specifics.